G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Chime a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, have you ever received an overdraft fee unexpectedly? I know I have, and it really feels like I was being taken advantage of. I hate how this happens when you least expect it to, like when you're just withdrawing some cash you expect to be in your account because you should be paid your week's wage by that point, only to find out that you haven't been paid yet, and so you've overdrawn. Trust me, I've been there and it really felt like I was scammed out of my hard-earned dollars. Did you know that in 2019, traditional banks took $11 billion in overdraft fees? That's crazy, right? I mean, it's not like we don't have enough bills and stuff to worry about already. Well, Chime does things differently. Chime is an award-winning app and debit card that has saved its members more than $10 billion in overdraft fees with SpotMe fee-free overdraft. Eligible members can overdraft up to $200 on debit card purchases and cash withdrawals with absolutely no fees. Which means more of your hard-earned money in your own pockets where it should be. Now, you deserve to have financial peace of mind. Join the millions of Americans already loving Chime. Sign up takes only two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started today at chime.com forward slash be scared. That's chime.com forward slash be scared. And in the spirit of transparency, banking services are provided by and debit cards are issued by the Bancor Bank or Stride Bank NA members FDIC. Spot me eligibility requirements do apply. Overdraft only applies to debit card purchases and cash withdrawals. Limits start at $20 and may be increased up to $200 by Chime. Chime members overdraft fee savings are based on eligible members use of SpotMe with a $33 average overdraft fee. And the overdraft fee data is based on the Bankrate Checking Account Survey and CRL June 2020 Overdraft Fees Report. It was the fall of 2009, and at the time, I was 16 years old. I live in the central part of North Carolina, and nowadays, the cities are loaded with things to do for Halloween season, but back then, the most form of entertainment that I could come up with was to visit the Devil's Tramping Ground with a few friends. But the Devil's Tramping Ground is a local legend, and it was about an hour away from where I lived. And I had just gotten my license, so why not? For those of you who are unfamiliar with the locale or its legend, the Devil's Tramping Ground is a perfect circular spot of dead soil in the middle of the woods. And despite the greenery around it, nothing grows in that circle. The legend says that if you drop or leave anything in the circle, it's moved and or disappears by morning as the devil supposedly comes here to plot his evil doings against humanity late at night, pacing in a circle as he thinks. That's basically the gist of it, but feel free to do a little bit of research if you're interested, because it's a decent read. Anyway, the city is a sticks and barns town with long barren roads that seemingly translate to don't stop until you get the heck out of here. It was one such road too where I began to feel uneasy, Rural areas always have that heavy sort of twilight zone energy and the road that we were on, conveniently titled Devil's Tramping Ground Road, was completely lacking streetlights. The only thing illuminating the overworked asphalt was the fading yellow headlights of my 2002 Mercury Cougar and the useless glow of a crescent moon. In those dim lights we began to see splattered graffiti on the road leading up to the location Creepy things that I really didn't expect, I guess, but never really would have understood the impact of until, well, I saw them. In white paint, the road was decorated in crude warnings. The one that I remember the most was the devil lives here, and a huge white cross in front of an opening in the forest. I parked on the side of the road, though. The grounds were immediately not as creepy as I expected, to be honest. It was not too deep into the woods, either. In fact, the clearing could be made out from the road pretty much. Not as menacing as I had imagined. Maybe it was the empty beer cans or red solo cups lying all around. Obviously, people partied there. Or maybe it was the jokes my friends and I started making almost immediately that calmed my nerves. 
but it was two something in the morning. We decided to catch Lucifer right on his hour, and I remember feeling less on edge than I was on the road. My flashlight would get eaten through the trees if I moved it upwards, so I focused its beam on the soil, but truly more interested in finding signs of the paranormal than my friends were. It was four of us total. Two of my friends went back to the car after a while as well. It was cold and there was not much to see really, so I stayed back with a buddy of mine though. I brought Ziplocs with me, along with a pocket Bible, a rosary in my pocket, just in case you know, and a stuffed rabbit that one of my best friends had given me. Before leaving, I scooped up some dirt and added it to the Ziploc. I know that that might sound a little weird, but I found the prospect of completely dead soil really interesting and figured that maybe studying under proper light compared to other soil would give me a better idea of what maybe happened here. Alien radiation, maybe? Climate change? Sulfur? Maybe the devil was just busy that night. In between all the jokes and complaining about the cold, though, we suddenly heard someone walking in the depths of the woods. This wasn't a mistaken sound, too. This was a, I think someone is walking in the woods sound. It was definite, and it was a definite feeling too. This was deep behind the brush, between the trees, and these steps were heavy and unashamed of being heard. And I think it was at this point that this was the first time that I noticed no crickets were in these woods. There was no sound, in fact, other than us and these, well, steps. And... I was even more unwilling to lift my little flashlight, which was tucked under my armpit now and pointed towards my soil sample. My eyes didn't need adjusting and so we sort of stood there as I made out the shape of, well, something in those woods. It was dark, but I could definitely see it. It was tall, but not disgustingly tall, I guess. It was human-shaped. It definitely stood on two feet. It would walk and walk and then sort of stop in a pattern. I think it was coming towards us, but it was at this point that we were petrified. And neither my friend or I moved a muscle. I don't even think we breathed. I was so overcome with fear that I felt numb, but a little tremble ran through my entire body. And we just sort of, well, stood there and stared. Later we would discuss how we both wondered if it had seen us and talk about how we didn't want to move in case it hadn't. And at this future time we would also discuss the smell. It was awful. A putrid scent. A burning feces, rotten eggs, rotten meat. It was something like that. I grew up a Catholic, hence the Bible and the rosary, and have always been told that smell means the devil is around. And having all this in the back of my mind at that point certainly didn't help. This thing stayed there too, toying with us among the sticks of the forest. I say sticks because at the time, very little greenery was actually alive. I was certain at one point that it saw me too. I had that sort of sixth sense feeling I was being stared right back at. And suddenly I had the weirdest feeling. A feeling of overwhelming, unbearable despair. I realized then that my friend had been clutching the back collar of my shirt. I think I was so paralyzed with fear that I had ceased to feel anything but that numbness. I wasn't even cold anymore. But when I felt my friend's hand, I just dropped everything in my arms, stood up, and hauled my butt back to the car. Not running, but just very hurried. I was sure that my friend was behind me, but between us and in all honesty, I didn't even think about it at that time. I just wanted to get out of there and I was ready to go. In fact, I was so ready to go that I missed the clear path completely and took off between trees and brush heading towards the yellow glow of the headlights. It wasn't an incredibly long trek or anything, like I said before. The road was right there, but it felt awful and really long to me because I did this. And it was enough for those tiny branches to leave little scrapes and even some cuts down my hands, cheeks and neck. And although retelling this story makes it seem like it went on for a long time, but this whole ordeal couldn't have lasted very long. When I got back to my car though, the keys were already in the ignition, the other two friends had the heat on, and they both asked me what happened. 
The friend who stayed behind with me got in the passenger seat soon after and we took off. Our other friends, the ones who had been in the car, suddenly pointed out though that our eyes were swollen and like bright red. I think maybe we'd been crying or at least it looked like we had been. I looked in the rearview mirror and my pupils as well were like abnormally dilated. My eyelids were puffy and tender and red. Keep in mind, this could all have some form of explanation. Maybe the fear made us cry without us knowing. Maybe the darkness combined with our nervous reactions enlarged our pupils. Maybe the dirt did something. But the whole thing was still very odd. I realized long after that that I actually left my Bible there, my stuffed rabbit, and my Ziploc bag of dirt in the circle. I considered going back the next day in broad daylight, but I haven't been back since. Oddly enough, too, I still wonder and worry about what or who might have my stuff. So my story comes when I first started dating my now husband. His name is B. We were both 20 and his parents had asked that we stay over at their house to house it while they were away on vacation for a few days. I readily agreed because I knew that they'd have no problem with me bringing my dog. But they paid for food and bought groceries and live closer to town than I do as well. So I was happy to do it, even when B had to work since I wasn't working at that time. It sounded super relaxing and was just what I needed at that time. And the first night went smoothly. It was a typical night. We had pizza and watched a movie, I think, and went to bed early because it was Sunday and be worked early the next day. I had a nightmare that night, but couldn't really remember it when I woke up. So it sort of made me anxious, but I couldn't put my finger on why. My dog Abby is an ESA, now retired since I have SD, and so she did her thing and was immensely helpful. I cleaned some, did some laundry for my mother-in-law since she was behind and just sort of hung out. At some point I got a call around midday that B's cousin was dropping a dog off. There was a disagreement between her and her parents and the dog was going to live with my in-laws from now on. And I thought, cool, I love that dog. Its name is Oakley. I was more than happy to take him in for them early. But B came home and all was well. Now, my in-laws have an entertainment system and bar in their basement, so we decided to go downstairs to watch our favorite shows for the night. My Abbey girl went down, but Oakley would just not go downstairs. Plain refused to at the top of the stairs. He was so freaked out about the situation, he started shaking harder than I've ever seen a dog shake. He was petrified. I finally told B that we should just stay upstairs. It was no big deal. And as we ate, I started to think about how Abby never let her guard down in the basement. She would always face the bathroom that they had down there and would never leave my side. She would stand in front of me and a few times she even growled. But it's an old house, I guess, so I figured that maybe she was hearing the house moving or something. I went to sleep that night and that was the night that I had the most real and petrifying nightmare that I have ever had in my life still to this day. I was laying in the bed that I had fallen asleep in. I looked up and then at the wall across from me, it was there. It was this black thing and it smelt like death and tar. Extremely tall, bending in the middle to not hit its head. Its proportions were all wrong arms were way too long, legs too short and angled sort of awkwardly. It had long black hair that looked wet with how it clumped together, black holes for eyes with blue lips. It was veiny and made an awkward sort of sucking noise when it breathed. It had both dull and sharp teeth, almost like some were broken or something. But the worst part, believe it or not, was its limp. It made this sort of thud and dragging noise while it walked towards me, laughing. And not a booming laugh, but sort of like a, an internal laugh. Like when you're trying not to show someone that you're laughing. But its maniacal smile gave it away. It was excited and I was scared. I started trying to scream and at some point 
I must have woken up, but when I did, he was still there, still coming towards me. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe, and was sobbing. I, I kept trying to scream, but it felt like I had a piano laying on my chest. Oakley came running from the living room and let out a huge snarl. I finally screamed, and I was so frantic I screamed for my mum since I thought that I couldn't get my husband's attention. But he flew up and turned on his side table light and looked at me, and when he did, it was gone. For a moment there, I honestly felt like I had just skirted by death. I called Oakley up on the bed who was crying now and trying to get closer to me. He laid in my lap and essentially just hugged me. My husband checked the entire house armed with a bat. He found my poor Abby locked in a bathroom crying and howling. as She had been with Oakley when we went to sleep so I'm really not sure why or how she got locked in there. Once let out though she came and immediately checked me out and traded places with Oakley. Oakley then went to look around with my husband. He checked everywhere with him, except the basement. He again refused to go down, so my husband did a quick check and found no one down there. When he came upstairs, I explained that I just had to leave. I just had to get away from that house for a while, so I took the dogs and we went out for an early morning food run. Then we drove for a bit. It was snowing like crazy and probably not my best idea, but I still felt safer than I had at that house. I did end up going back. The next night was my last night, so I just didn't sleep and stayed on the couch with the dogs laying on or near me. And I have never been so happy to leave somewhere, trust me. I no longer house it for them and they have heard the story. Don't get me wrong, I'm fine visiting for a few hours, but... I can't do any more than that. I still feel watched too and stalked when I go there. You would think that his parents might find me a bit nutty, but the worst part of the whole thing is that when I told them, they weren't surprised. They knew exactly what I was talking about. So this happened about four years ago. I was 20 at the time. The first time that I met the guy who would become my grocery store stalker, he was standing outside the store collecting money for the Salvation Army Christmas time donations. I'm a fairly friendly person, so I like to say hi to people who work at places I frequent to be nice. This guy was a kid around my age, very tall with a mild resemblance to Lurch from the Adams Family. Dark circles under dark eyes, short black hair, kind of vacant looking in his eyes. But I chatted with him for maybe two minutes, just idle chit chat about the weather and whatnot. Nothing particularly memorable or interesting and I waved goodbye and went home. Little did I know though that that single moment would have me genuinely afraid. So about four or five months passed and I hadn't seen him again. Then one day, as I was grocery shopping with a friend, when, as we were chatting, she suddenly got really quiet and kind of recoiled backwards, looking behind me. I turned around to see this guy, who had to be at least 6'4", towering over me, not 8 inches from my body. He said hi, and told me that he remembered me from that December that I had talked to him, and then asked for my number. I... Being young and never had experienced this type of interaction before, told him that I didn't have my number memorized, but that I would write his down and text it to him later. I kind of half waved my phone at him, pointing out my at the time boyfriend whose picture was my wallpaper, making a point to say, oh look, that's my boyfriend, to the guy, hoping that he would clue in, but no luck. He told me his number which immediately upon getting, I blocked without letting him get my phone number. However, what really made my blood run cold was what he said after I put my phone away. You see, he leaned in real close and in a low voice, he told me, whatever I text you is for your eyes only. At this point, I started feeling genuinely uncomfortable. I said, uh, yeah, sure, uh, Nice talking to you, but we got to get back to shopping. And I grabbed my friend and dragged her off, shooting a panicked look at her and asking why she didn't bail me out. 
Apparently, he scared her too with his getting so close to me and she didn't know what to do. I want to make it clear too that I'm not exactly a small girl. At 5'8 and pretty solidly built, I can certainly handle myself and I very rarely feel intimidated or small in the presence of anyone, male or female, but this guy, he made me feel tiny and scared. In the months that would follow, he would make me feel truly frightened though and I had hoped that the creepy interaction would be the last time that I saw him, but that was unfortunately not the case. After that initial meeting with him, saying that creepy thing about his text being for my eyes only, it seemed like I would run into him almost every single time that I got to the store. No matter what checkout lane I was in, he always seemed to appear at the end of it when I was finished shopping, and every time I was in the store I would notice him out of the corner of my eye just watching me, no matter what area I was in. One time I even caught him following me out to my car, and it was at that point that I got scared and decided to say something to the managers. After letting the managers know what was going on, they assured me that they would tell him not to talk to me. After that, he wouldn't speak to me, but I would continue to see him following me around the store at a distance every time that I went up there. It got so bad and I felt so frightened that I started to be afraid to go to the store at all. But I'm one of those stubborn people who just refuses to be intimidated by someone to the point where I'll stop doing something. I had hoped that maybe it was just a coincidence that he was following me. After all, it was a big store and maybe he just had things to do that just happened to be in the areas that I was shopping in. So I started to pay close attention to my surroundings. Once I started really paying attention too, I realized that... Every single time I was up there, I would constantly notice him in the areas of the store that I was in. During my last encounter with him, I went up to the store to grab just two or three items I needed for dinner that night, and I first saw him standing outside the store when I got there, and with his back to me, I quickly ran inside, hoping that he didn't see me. Unfortunately, a few minutes later, I saw him at the very back of the store, and items in hand, I immediately made a beeline towards the front. As soon as I got near the checkout, I ducked behind one of the shelf displays and watched carefully at the front of the store to see if this guy would appear, and he did. I watched as he looked up and down the checkout, and when he didn't see me there, I saw him step outside. At this point, I quickly ran into the nearest open cashier, rang up my items, and stuck my head out the door to look for him. I didn't see him there immediately, so I started trying to make my way back to where I was parked. I had parked a ways away near the side of the store where a bunch of other smaller stores and restaurants were lined up and I was walking towards my car when I realized that I saw him standing by the entrance that I had first entered the store through and quickly ducked behind a pillar immediately hoping that he didn't see me. I watched carefully from behind the pillar and as he scanned the parking lot he obviously couldn't find me. After a minute or two he started to walk out towards the direction of the parking lot in front of the store, and so I took that opportunity to make a run for it to my car as soon as he was far enough away that I felt safe. Now, as soon as I got into my car, I locked all the doors, and to my horror, when I looked up, he was standing there about 15 feet away from my car with a shopping cart in front of him. I knew too that he had followed me, and he knew that I knew as well. I fully believed that he had chased after me and when I made it to my car, he grabbed the nearest car to make it look like he was collecting them for the parking lot. And I just remember feeling absolutely terrified at that moment. I quickly went home and immediately told my grandfather what had happened. I began crying and shaking and my grandfather told me to get in the car. We were going to settle this. He and I drove up to the store in his car and he walked me into the store and demanded that we spoke with the managers immediately, both of them. When the managers arrived at customer service, he asked me to tell them what had been happening and demanded that they ensure he left me alone or he would involve the police. The managers swore up and down that they would take care of it. As far as I know, he wasn't fired immediately. 
because my friend who first encountered him with me when this whole thing began told me that she would see him from time to time when she was there by herself, but that any time that I went with her that she would never see him. I fully believe that he knew whenever I was there, only this time instead of stalking me, he was avoiding me now. Eventually, everyone who knew the situation stopped seeing him there, so I think he may have gotten fired or maybe he moved on from that store. Either way, I haven't had any issues since, but I have never, ever in my life felt so afraid of another human being as I did that day seeing him eye contact with me in the parking lot as I was locking my car doors. It still really creeps me out too to think that he was watching me so closely every time that I entered that store and that he could so easily avoid or follow me whenever and wherever he wanted. This all occurred about five years ago now. I had a friend in high school who I'll refer to as D, and D and I were very good friends for a long time. I was having home issues at the time and had developed some anxiety due to it, but I was at his house as much as I could for comfort and whatnot. I never experienced any sort of weird stuff for at least a few months into knowing him, but as time progressed, that all changed. And progressively, things got just worse and worse. I refuse to go over to his house now, too, and our friendship has drifted due to this. Keep this in mind, too. I don't believe that there was a ghost in his house. I believe that there was something far more dark and sinister. So, I want to elaborate on why I think that something of that nature would be attracted to Dee's house, and why it would try to harm me. So a bit of background about Dee and his family that I personally think attributed to whatever haunted his house, or rather haunted me. They were absolute slobs. I mean their house was filthy and disgusting beyond belief. And the more I got to know Dee and his family, the more I realized how negative they all were. Especially Dee who I was best friends with at this time. His dad was an addict and so was Dee an addict to weed, alcohol, food, smoking, anything, it didn't matter. They just lacked any semblance of self-control pretty much. And this, I believe, was the main cause of it all. You see, I got D into PC gaming, and let's just say that he isn't too clever with his browsing history, and I accidentally stumbled onto some particular taste that he has, a very odd specific taste. I won't disclose what it was, but know that it was definitely something that would attract evil, if you believe in that sort of thing. I'm no prude by any means, so trust me when I say I, I doubt that this taste is anything that you've ever looked up at night. Anyway, I started to realize over the months that we were spending together pretty much every day, that Dee was a dark person full of jealousy, hatred, selfishness, and objectively speaking, just a, a really dumb person. He didn't really try to hide his vices too. But I found a lot of disturbing things in his room and in closets in his house as well. I obviously kept everything to myself and he ended up telling me about his problems with his tastes years later. And we both experienced a paranormal event that night but that's a long and an entirely different story which I'll get to another time maybe. But for now I think it's important to note that I was raised Christian, hold Christian beliefs, but am generally a, a bad Christian and have struggled with my faith and following what I believe for years. And this hypocritical conviction I believe played a significant role in my haunting. His family attended a cultish church that partakes in holy laughter and speaking in tongues, all that stuff, something I was raised to believe was false and wrong. Whatever was haunting that house only haunted me as well. And still to this day, Dee and his family either think that I made everything up or they just don't care. I don't know which is true, but to be honest, it doesn't matter, I suppose. Anyway, I'll begin with the first experience. So this must have been maybe around six months into being there every day, but it might have been sooner. But I started keeping my gaming PC at Dee's house after knowing each other for a few months and this came after some other stuff at home happened, and when Dee wasn't home, I would hang out there alone and chill after school. 
I mean, I practically lived at this place. But I kept all my stuff in his small guest bedroom, which shared a wall with Dee's room. And the first experience I had, I was playing CSGO and heard what sounded like footsteps directly above my head. To give context to people who don't know what CSGO is, it's basically a competitive game that requires a lot of focus, so even though I could hear these sounds above my head, I pretty much just ignored them. And it was the first time that I would hear these footsteps. Footsteps that would become all too familiar. The footsteps always sounded like heavy boots as well like pirate boots on a, on a boat that you'd hear in something like Pirates of the Caribbean, the dramatic large thuds with each step. The sounds persisted for at least 10 minutes off and on before abruptly stopping, which was immediately followed by the closet door, a thin sliding plywood door an arm's length away, being hit from the inside extremely hard. Imagine a small child were to run into a door. It was that loud. The desk my monitor was on shook, in fact, and I was just baffled and stuck in my chair from pure fear. I stared at this sliding door, waiting for it to open, but it became quiet instead. No footsteps, no banging, nothing. Just a really weird, eerie silence. It scared me to the point, too, where... I just sprinted out of the room and to the front of his house where I stayed until Dee got home. I told him what happened and he didn't think much of it. We went into the room and he slid open the door, but of course there was nothing. I searched the whole closet. There were no holes that rats could have come out of, only a few empty cardboard boxes and man, I searched everywhere, but there was nothing. But from this point on, it became a, a bit of a norm for me to hear footsteps directly above my head, but only whenever I was there alone. And the footsteps, they would follow me throughout the house too. And occasionally I would stop and they would stop like right above my head. And if I stayed still long enough, they would then begin stomping. I can't emphasize enough just how much they matched my movement too. And this may sound odd, but they sort of reacted to my thoughts, I think. Like, I would think to myself, okay, I'm going to move in three, two, one. Then, before I actually moved, the footsteps would stomp around and walk in circles. It was horrifying, honestly, and I seriously could not explain it to myself. This was obviously disturbing me, but I really didn't have anywhere else to go, so I just tried to ignore it and chalked it up to rats or something. This phenomenon, though, it would happen every few days when I was alone in the house, and each time it would terrify me, and it made me feel so alone. Fast forward a year, maybe, though. I'm lying in bed. It's Saturday morning, and I'm there in the house alone in the guest room. Dee is at work. His parents aren't home. It's 11 a.m., and I'm scrolling mindlessly on my phone. Breaking the dead silence instantly, though, I hear footsteps in the attic. But this time, running from across the house very aggressively to exactly over my head. I remember it vividly, too. The running stopped right over my head, and I just sort of laid there in fear and in silence looking up at the ceiling. The footsteps, they seemed like they were angry. I know, it's weird saying that footsteps can be angry, but that's the best way I can describe it. And for the first time, I actually felt a presence. I know, it's hard to explain, but imagine your eyes are closed and someone gets very close to your face. And even though you can't see or hear them, you can definitely sense that they're there. And that's how it began to feel with this thing, whatever it was. I would sort of sense it before I heard it. And I became very acute to its presence over the years as well. In any case, it was a good two minutes before I went to get out of the bed and then, exactly as I had mentioned with the footsteps to the thought of myself moving, a loud crash directly above me, right where I was looking, straight into the ceiling from the attic. And it was as if you were like deadlifting 150 pounds and then just threw it onto the ground as hard as you could. And at that, I immediately sprinted out of the house again. Except this time, I actually walked home because... Well, I knew that it was going to be hours before anyone was home. 
And this is where I started actually dreading sleeping at this house. I mean, what is in this attic? I became sort of obsessed with that question. I told Dee this and he nonchalantly wrote it off as an animal, but as much as I explained it to him that it reacted to my thoughts, he just didn't think much of it. Anyway, a few days after this we were in the garage where there's an entryway into his attic. I convinced him to get a ladder and see what we can find in there. I went up first and shined a light deep into the darkness of the room. I couldn't see anything and no amount of money on earth was going to compel me to enter that room, that was for sure. But something about it was just wrong. I saw, however, a box. A black box. It was in the back right corner of the attic, right above the guest room, and I could only guess that this was the box that was dropped over my head a few days previous. I had D look, and he saw it as well. In hindsight, I sort of wish we had gone in and looked at what was in that box. I'll come back to this later though, but at this point I want to clarify that I am completely stable, have no history of schizophrenia or insanity in my family, I'm an extremely rational person and up until this point had no interest or belief in spirits or ghosts or demons and I want to preface this because things get a little bit crazy after this. So Dee had a dog who I'll refer to as P. P and I were pretty much best friends. He was truly an extraordinary dog too. I loved him with all my heart and he comforted me in my lowest moments since life was hard then and I never really opened up to anyone. And when I experienced all these things happening to me, P was there for me. So when I say alone, I, I really wasn't completely alone, I suppose. In fact, I think if P wasn't there, I probably would not have been able to endure it. He was with me every single time that I'd walk to get water or go to the bathroom, make food, and the loud horrifying footsteps would come back instantly over my head. It was basically a, a jump scare that could come randomly and... It made me very paranoid and hesitant to move around in the house, to be honest. Whatever it was, it was an abusive thing that enjoyed sort of taunting me and toying with me, I suppose. But Dee and his family left for a week to go on vacation at one point and asked me to take care of P. At this point in time, I had two computers. I kept one at Dee's house and one at my own, and things had subsided a bit at my house, so I didn't spend every night at Dee's house anymore but I went over to Dee's house pretty much every day and played with P and fed him and whatnot. I would hang out there for a few hours and then I would head home. Now three days after Dee's family left, I walk into their house and P is just sort of freaking out, barking at something in the middle of his living room. I try to calm him down, but he just won't. He's gnarling and barking as if something was in the middle of the living room. And finally, after what seemed like five or ten minutes, I would guess, he relaxes a bit, still on guard though, and follows me to his food bowl, and then into the guest room where I played some games. But there were no footsteps though, or presence, that I was now very sensitive to, to be felt or heard, which was a rarity, I'll admit. I leave, and the next day I come over to the same thing. P is freaking out, this time way more aggressively too. He's moving around the living room, but his gaze and posture is poised around the center of this room as he moves around it. But this time, I definitely feel the presence. And as I watch P bark and whimper and freak out, I sort of stand still and try and listen. I listen for at least five minutes, and I swear I, I didn't move a single muscle. But P eventually calmed down and looked at me as if he knew I was just standing there listening and he knew that I knew that there was something there. Finally though, I think, alright, well, I don't hear anything. Maybe P is just upset that Dean's and his family are gone? This is the first time they left since I had known them and they spent a lot of time in the living room together. And as I barely moved like even a centimeter, they were like massive booms right above my head. I must have jumped at least five foot in the air too, but stomping and jumping and clawing on the floor above my head, P starts freaking out and starts to almost attack the air in the middle of the living room, biting and gnashing his teeth. 
I am thoroughly freaked out, so I just run over to P's food bowl, pour in a lot of food, and I just bail out of that house. And it was around this time that I realized that I really just do not ever want to be in that house again, alone or not. The next two or three days I go over there. P is still freaked out, but no barking or anything related to the living room. And I just quickly fed him and then I left. But on the last day, the last day before D and his family came home, something, something happened. I enter the door and immediately I feel this presence. It's almost as if the air itself gets sort of humid and thick. I'm on guard and P is sort of crying this time though. I mean, he's literally crying and jumping on me and whimpering as I enter the door. I take one step into the room and there's a loud footstep right above me. The first step I took into the house, I had gotten almost annoyed with this thing at this point it was the first step that I took into this house as well, which sort of surprised me a bit. It surprised me a bit too, because normally it sort of takes a minute or two, but this time it was right off the bat. I had gotten almost annoyed with this thing at this point too. I didn't want to bother to stop and listen too, so I just headed straight to P's food bowl. I walk over to the side room where it's kept, and it's missing. The food bag, which is heavy and zipped, is still sitting there, obviously, but the bowl is missing. I looked around, and as I walk around the house, I hear the footsteps following me in the attic above my head like normal. P is whimpering and every few seconds barking. I walk back out to the living room, and what I saw next literally has changed my life ever since. P's food bowl is sitting directly in the middle of this living room, right where P had been barking and attacking the air a few days prior. Not only this, it was completely full of food. In fact, it was now overflowing with food, as if it was a message. I knew why you were coming here. I remember walking backwards slowly out of the house at this, just sort of stunned. I honestly just barely could believe my own eyes. I shut the door and I got into my car. I forgot to mention too that I drove over with my girlfriend and it was late. She knew about Dee's house and the things that I'd experienced there so she came to sort of give me, I don't know, some confidence. But she said that when I got out to the car that I was as white as a ghost and apparently even had tears streaming down my face. Before I even said a word though, I had the car pulling out of the driveway. She frantically was asking me what happened. And it was at this moment that I decided that I would never go to this house alone ever again. Dee and his family came back and I told them what happened. His mum looked at me like I was a joke and she half listened to me and sort of half listened to the TV show that she was watching. I told his dad that Maybe a homeless person was living in the attic and that he has to look in there. And to my surprise, he finally accepted and he and Dee and I walked into the garage with a ladder and his dad peered into the attic with a flashlight. He said that there was nothing in here and I said look into the back right corner, there's a black box there. No there's not. Dee and I sort of looked at each other and for the first time ever I actually think D was finally a bit scared because he definitely saw that black box himself. D and I told his dad about the box. I told him that it was thrown at the ceiling floor when I was in the house alone one time. But he didn't care. He just simply shut the attic door, climbed down the stairs and put the ladder back. I told D that I was done sleeping at his house at this point and I was done staying here at all period. I told him that if he wants to come over to my house then that's fine but I was going to take my computer home and that was that. He was really angry about it but I told him that over the years he never took me seriously and things were going on in this house and I was done. It simply was just too scary for me to be there and after spending so much time there and enduring a lot of hardships in my own personal life I associated the horror of that house with the anxieties and worries of my own life too. Leaving that house for good too was a life-changing decision for me. I don't know why those things happened to me, but in a weird way it made me a stronger person, I guess. 
because I had to decide that I was done and I didn't care how I made Dee feel. I know that sounds selfish and maybe it is, but my whole life I never cared about myself first and this was the first time that I ever did. I have been back over there since I vowed to never go back over again and in the short times that I go over I still feel a presence there. But Dee was a good friend I suppose and he struggles with a lot of his own demons so when he begs me to come over for a few hours I often do. I tried to spend the night there one more time and the sliding closet door was ran into again like the first time as I was falling asleep and this completely solidified my decision to never stay there ever again. But I learned things about Dee after all this went down that made a lot of the evil in the house make a lot more sense. Dee, he was a really disturbed and confused person and his family has a history of really disturbing and sinister events too. Whatever is in his house has forever changed my life and my views on things that are just unexplainable. One day I was making a six hour drive. It was one that I had made several times as I was selling a house in another state, also while relocating. I was a female in my late 20s and was traveling with my puggle. He's a good dog and would try to protect me, but he just doesn't have the size to do much. So I had about two hours left of my drive and needed to get some gas or petrol. I pulled off the interstate to a small town with a gas station not far from the interstate. It was a very sunny day and I didn't even think about jumping out to pump my gas. After I started pumping, I realized that I'm like the only vehicle at this station. It was then too that I noticed two men standing around the front of the station and they start walking towards me in my vehicle. At first I think that they're just going to ask for money, but then I get this really creepy feeling with the way that they were looking at me. I start to panic and knowing that I probably can't get the hose out of my car and get back in before they're upon me. At that moment, a minivan pulls in with a mum and two large teenage boys. The boys hop out to go inside and as soon as they are seen, the men walk back to where they were standing. And now, I know that they didn't just want money. I get in my car and I call my then boyfriend, now husband, and tell him the story as I'm a bit shaken. He gets the location and quickly calls the local police and they know where this station is and said that they would go and check out the men. A little later they end up calling my boyfriend and tell him that they were thankful that he called as the men they had warrants out for their arrest and they had brought them in. So I was 16 years old and huge into photography. I lived in a rural area and I liked to go out for hikes on Tuesdays after school to a local reservoir to take some pictures with an old SLR. I pretty much parked in the same spot every time too. This is because it was a great way to get to the main trail and I could also go either way. Usually I was by myself. It wasn't a hugely populated area and not many people were ever there too. The parking place was usually used for school buses to turn around pretty much and that was about it. But after a while of going there I started to see this little blue Toyota there and there was some little old man in it but he didn't say anything or get out of his vehicle ever. He would just wave at me and I would politely wave back. But one day I was sitting in my back seat with the door open I was prepping my film and getting the rolls I needed for the hike when suddenly... He was right next to me and before I could react, he put his arm around me and told me, I'm going to kiss you now. Man, I didn't know how to react so I just shoved him. He was an older man, maybe in his late 60s or so. He didn't fall but he definitely stumbled. And he told me that I should have expected it since I was coming up there teasing him all the time like that and said, I'll see you again soon, sweetie. I watched him drive off and promptly just broke down. Obviously I cancelled my hike for the day and just sort of sat there for a while before going home. I didn't tell a single person about this experience until like a year ago. I'm not sure why this experience bothered me so much too but still to this day it 
just makes my skin crawl. All of this happened when I was a kid, about five or six years old. I was living in a sort of small two-bedroom apartment with my mom, dad, and my younger brother. Our apartment was located in the first floor of a four-story apartment building, and I was sleeping in a small bedroom with my brother, who was three or four years old at the time. My parents' room was right next to ours. The living room was across the hallway and had a sort of small balcony which faced the courtyard of the building. It wasn't the best part of town by any means too, but a pretty safe city where crimes very rarely ever took place. Still though, my parents were cautious and always closed and locked all of the doors. Now one night, and I still remember very vividly, I woke up because I heard somebody walking around. I saw a dark figure standing in the middle of my room all of a sudden, and at first I thought it was my mum taking my brother back to his bed as he still often went into their room when he had nightmares. But then I realised that my brother was sleeping safe and sound as I could hear him breathing slowly and calmly. Also, the figure was bigger and wider than my mum by quite a lot. Since it was so dark in the room, I couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman. In fact, I wasn't even sure if it was a real person at all or just a shadow. In the past, I had often had trouble sleeping at night because I believed the shadows in my room were monsters staring at me. My mother always told me that if I closed my eyes, they couldn't hurt me. And so I just closed my eyes and tried to go back to sleep. After a little bit of time though, I want to say maybe a few minutes, but it might have been just a few seconds. I'm not really sure, but my brother woke up and started crying. He got up and ran into my parents' bedroom. I kept laying still on my bed, keeping my eyes closed so the shadows would go away. And the next thing I remember was waking up in the morning as if nothing had ever happened. Now, I know that you could easily brush this off as just a kid having a nightmare, but hear me out, because here's where things get a little creepy. So at breakfast, my brother couldn't stop talking about the men that he saw, the men who were watching us. My father told him to stop talking nonsense, until I said that I saw a man too. But now my father got a bit angry, saying that if we kept talking about scary stories like this, we'd have trouble falling asleep at night. But my mum started freaking out a bit, because she said in the middle of the night, she too woke up to a strange noise. She looked up and saw a man standing in the doorway. When she reached over to get her glasses and take a better look at the guy, he was gone. But she also thought that it was just a shadow, when a few moments later, my brother came running into her room. Well, upon all of this, we immediately looked at all the doors and the windows. The main door was locked, along with pretty much everything else. However, we discovered the balcony door was actually unlocked. My parents checked all of our belongings, every valuable item that we had, but nothing was missing. Everything was exactly the way that it was the evening before, but we reported the incident to the police. They weren't able to find any signs of breaking or anything, no fingerprints and pretty much nothing. But my parents, they must have forgotten to lock the balcony door the night before. Needless to say, none of us slept well for the next couple of nights. Thankfully though, this was the only time that these men ever seemed to come to our house. But I think it's the fact that nothing was actually taken always made it feel even more creepier to me. I mean, with burglars at least, you know that they're after your stuff and not you, right? So first off, I just want to say that I don't really remember this story because, well, I was just a young kid when it happened, around four or five. But I do remember the nightmares and also my parents and I still talk about it. So when I was just a kid, my parents moved into a larger house to start a family. I had an older sister who was around 17 at the time, along with my mom and dad, and there were four of us in total. My parents decided on a white farmhouse out in the country with an old decrepit barn and a few outbuildings on the large plot of land that we now own. So, I remember having really bad night terrors about a tall man made of shadows at this place. 
One nightmare that I still remember vividly after 12 years too was that my room was actually on fire and I was sat in the corner of my bedroom crying as the tall shadow man stood over me and just watched me. Spooky, right? Well, my father used to work the midnight shift for a prison about 20 minutes away from our house. And one night, my mother woke up because she heard my dad come back home right after he left for work, so probably sometime after midnight. He apparently walked down the hallway towards my and my mother's room. Our rooms were right across from each other at the end of a long hallway and then just stop outside of her open door. She claims that she called out to him, but he didn't respond, and that she couldn't see him despite having the door open and my nightlight shining from out of the room, towards the hallway that is. When my mum asked my dad about it the next day, he said that he never came back home that night. My mother also claims that she had heard footsteps when nobody else was home. She was a stay-at-home mother and my sister and I went to school and that she felt the bed move after dad left for work one time. Now, I've had a lot of vivid nightmares at that house, but I don't remember a lot of them, and they sort of stopped happening as I got older too. My dad still feels bad about not being able to protect us from the evil ghosts, and tells me that he used to walk into my room and start pleading with an unseen force to leave his family alone. But as surprising as it may seem, I sort of loved living in that house though, and I was sad when we had to move away. Looking back, a lot of weird things happened in that house, but I never really cared and was more interested in playing with my little sister all the time. I had a lot of nightmares, deja vu, along with both of my parents. I've never asked my older sister about it, but, you know, after sharing this, maybe I should. I don't know. Either way, it's an old story, and it's from a long time ago, so... Thanks for listening. When I finished college, I was living in a one-bedroom townhouse. I met a guy on Plenty of Fish, and at that time, I wasn't exactly smart about my online digital footprint. Not like I've really changed, but at least now I'm not as ridiculous as I was. Anyway... He seemed like a decent guy, he was really good looking, said that he had a good job, nice teeth, don't judge me, and looked like he cared about his personal health. All things I would typically look for in a guy. I'm not a shallow person by any means, but I like to be presentable, and if I'm with someone, I would like them to care about being presentable in a business environment also. After about a week of chatting online, we agreed to meet. We met at a restaurant downtown, which was really far from where I lived. When I got there, I noticed him sort of standing at the door, and we sat down to eat, and the evening went pretty well. At the end of the date, we said goodbye, and I got into my car and began to drive away. But I realized right away that he was following me. But because of the distance to my house, I wasn't immediately scared because, I mean, it's a big city. Maybe he's going to turn off the freeway or something? but he didn't. My exit was coming up and I decided not to take it. I just kept driving and I circled the entire city on the freeway and he stayed right behind me. At this I was starting to panic a bit so I decided to go to my friend's house instead of mine and when I pulled out the exit I noticed that he didn't. So I had a little bit of a moment of breathing and Decided, okay, screw this, I'll just go home. I took the off-ramp back onto the freeway and began going back to my exit. I got home and showered and was getting ready for bed and I started feeling dumb because like, was that really him? Am I just overreacting? Do I ask if he was following me? Like, just a number of things were racing through my overactive imagination. Well, so I thought at least. I decided that I was going to message him and just say, had a good time, good night. And when I started typing, all of a sudden a message came through to my phone of a picture of my car outside of my house. I was really freaked out by that. My heart jumped out of my chest, in fact, and I started shaking. I didn't know what to say, and he texts me and says, I didn't know you lived across the street from me. Now... I've met my neighbors before and not once have I ever met this guy. There's a huge apartment complex kitty corner to my townhouse, so maybe that's where he lived. 
I don't know. I popped up and went to sort of look outside and there he was just standing there outside like he was waiting for me. I opened the door and he asked if he could come in and if I wanted to still hang out. I told him that I was sort of exhausted and I would rather just crash out as it had been a long day. He left at that and that was pretty much it for that night. The next morning I woke up to go to work and did my hair and everything like I always do and when I got outside, my windshield had been completely smashed in. My car was keyed and my back two tires were slashed. And as I was noticing the damage to my vehicle, the same guy comes out of his car with two coffees and is like, oh, I thought I would surprise you with a morning coffee. So, again, I'm pretty freaked out. Then at this, I called the cops and I reported the damage to my vehicle. This guy offered to drive me to work instead and something in my gut was just like, don't you dare get in that car. So I called my boss and told them the situation and explained that I wasn't going to be there until at least after the police came. This guy too just hung out the whole time. When the police finally did get there, this guy was acting really suspicious and he walked away and was like sort of hiding on the other side of cars and... I filed the report and the police basically said, hope you have insurance and, and they're on their way to leave. They pulled around the corner and all I heard was the siren on the cop lights turn on and the cops screaming, freeze, put your hands in the air and get down on your knees. I look and the cop has his gun out at this guy and this dude's like on the ground getting arrested all of a sudden. I spoke to the cop after he got this guy into the back of his vehicle and he explained that he was actually wanted for stalking, breach of probation, assault with a deadly weapon, fraud, and even aggravated sexual assault. And to say that I was shook is a complete understatement. It took me uh, at least a couple of days to get over the hypothetical situations that could have happened. About a week later, I was on my way out the door to work and guess who's sitting in my driveway? We live in Canada, so essentially you're released on conditions until you go to jail. I told him that I was late for work, but that I would call him after I was done. I never went to work that day. I went and found a new apartment on the other side of the city. I also changed my phone number and hired my friend's husband and his friends to go pack my apartment up and move it to their place for a month and then move it to my new place because I was just way too scared of this dude and really worried that he was going to follow them while moving. So that's my story and that was the first and last time that I ever used plenty of fish. The year was 1994 and I was a freshman in high school. My family had just relocated to Michigan and we moved into a private golf course in a small town outside of Detroit. But for some reason too, I really, really wanted to get a job at the time and the restaurant in the neighborhood clubhouse was hiring dishwashers. Since it was pretty much a stone throw away from our house, my parents okayed me to be able to work in the later evenings after school. So a little bit about teenager me. I was a super sensitive kid and my feelings were easily hurt if I was talked down to. I was also a rule follower and extremely submissive to authority figures, which apparently made me an easy kid to raise, according to my parents. But anyway, given that this was my first job ever, while having no confidence and paper thin skin as well, I was destined not to last very long under the high pressure of the restaurant industry. I was doomed to fail in other words, but I still went for it. And sure enough, the chaotic pace of working in a high-end kitchen quickly overwhelmed me and I found myself having a hard time keeping up. On top of that, my boss was an absolute tyrant. I basically felt habitually crushed as he'd scream at me to keep up during the dinner rush. I was as much of a mess on the inside as the mess I was trying to clean up. But the worst part about it was that after the restaurant would close, I would have to stay for like an hour or so alone with him to close up nobody around just me and him 
During this time, he would continue to yell at me and, at best, roll his eyes if I needed help. Even as sensitive as I was, I kind of knew that his rage wasn't a, a personal thing, though. He was just a, a really disturbed individual by the looks of things. One night that I had off, I also caught an episode of the TV show America's Most Wanted. I don't know if it's still on, but basically they would do these segments, with extremely poor reenactments, mind you, of criminals that were on the run from the FBI. Sometimes they'd have real photos of the fugitives, but other times they would just have police sketches instead. During one of the segments, a sketch came up of a subject that eerily looked similar to my boss. They said that he had murdered several victims on the West Coast, and that's where he was last seen a while back. They also identified him with a different name, which kind of put me at ease for a moment, but the drawing looked a lot like him and their description of his height, weight, and other attributes fit him to a T. Well, I convinced myself that it must have just been a lookalike, but I just had that weird twisting and turning in my gut that maybe, maybe it was actually him. I mean, I was about to quit anyway, so it didn't really matter, I guessed, but the next day I went into work, and he was a no-show. In fact, he ended up leaving town and no one ever heard from him again. In fact, he pretty much vanished like a David Copperfield magic trick. We didn't have internet at the time too, so there wasn't the opportunity to like immediately jump on social media to investigate. I don't remember reading anything in the newspaper, but the rumor of his disappearance definitely went around town. Unfortunately, or who knows, maybe fortunately... I also don't remember anything else about him. I can't recall his name or really even his face these days. Just the creepy and really odd experience. I mean, who knows if it actually was him or not. But to think that I may have been alone with an angry murderer as a teenager is a tad bit uneasy to say the least. Anyway, if it was him, I'm very thankful that I got out of that one unscathed. So I started dating my girlfriend at the end of my senior year, and before we started dating, I used multiple dating apps. In many of my dating app profiles, I had my Snapchat listed so that people could add me. This is important too, but nothing led to anything within the dating apps themselves. I would talk to people for a bit, and eventually the conversation would just die out. When I began dating my girlfriend, I had deleted the apps but never really deleted my account, meaning that people could still see my profile and my Snapchat in it. I realized this only after a few people would add me, but it didn't go anywhere because I would tell them that, well, I had a girlfriend. As you would imagine, too, the conversation would pretty much always end there. But there was this one guy that added me. His name was Adam, and he asked me if I was available. Being straight, I was used to guys adding me, so I gave him the usual response of, sorry, I'm straight, and I actually have a girlfriend. And honestly, I sort of expected him to just leave me alone, but he didn't. At first, the messages were fairly normal, like, how was your day? What did you do today? Simple stuff like that. Being the nice guy that I try to be, at least, I responded because I thought that this guy just wanted to be friends. And having a gay friend is alright by me. Then the messages, though, they progressively got more and more creepy. Like, he started asking me questions about my girlfriend, and not the basic questions. Questions like, do you guys make out a lot, or does she like you in bed? I simply responded with, those are kind of personal questions, dude, and I don't feel like it's right for me to share my dating business. Adam would always apologize, and he wouldn't talk to me for a few days after that, but then he would hit me up again and ask some more creepy questions. I eventually told my girlfriend about the situation too, and while my girlfriend is super sweet, she's also very aggressively protective over me, so she adds this guy and basically tells him that he needs to leave me alone. Unfortunately, though, this seemed to enrage Adam, who responded with saying that I needed to dump this girl now because well, 
expletives. Naturally, I defended my girlfriend and blocked at him. And everything was pretty cool for a week. Until another account added me. The guy's name was Tyler and he was super chill. He was really nice to me and respected my relationship with my girlfriend. As the days go by, I start to notice that Tyler's vocabulary was actually very similar to Adam's. I wasn't sure about it though, so I didn't make any assumptions that it actually was him. So I gave Tyler's snap to my girlfriend, who adds him to investigate. And as soon as she adds Tyler's snap, Tyler flips out at her, which confirms that it was Adam. As soon as this realization is made, though, I, I block him again. From here, though, everything goes quiet from Adam for probably about a month, I would say. So, I live in the suburbs of Chicago, and both my girlfriend and I live down the street from each other. Naturally, we do see each other a lot, and both our families are really good friends. On top of that, our families would also house sit or pet sit for each other from time to time. And anyway, a month goes by until I get a letter with no address or name on it. Just my name in the front. I open it, and to my shock and horror, it's basically a, a love letter from Adam. The premise of the letter was basically him saying that he loves me and he wants me to run off with him. The letter also takes a, a very sexual turn halfway through with him describing what he wants to do to me and vice versa. And at this moment, two horrifying realizations suddenly hit me. One is that he knows my address, and two, he dropped that letter off himself, meaning that he is in my town. Well, I immediately called my girlfriend, who was equally as shocked as I am, and after consulting with my parents, we eventually call the cops. Unfortunately, since I had blocked as well as removed Adam's social media information, and that the letter had no return address, there was really nothing that we could do about it. But, day after day, letters would keep appearing in my mailbox until they also started appearing in my girlfriend's mailbox as well. Her letters were way worse than mine. Adam wrote of how much he hated her and how much he wanted to like hurt her and stuff. He also started stating many times of the ways he would inflict pain upon her, until she broke up with me, that is. Just like me too, she took this to the cops and again though, they couldn't really do anything about it. My girlfriend's family had plans to go to Hawaii for a vacation though and I was actually going to house sit for them. And the first couple of days went pretty much without event. Until around maybe one or the last nights of the week, I can't exactly remember. But as per usual, I was over at their house just watching TV on the couch when... All of a sudden, the power went out. Mind you, it's like around 1am and it's pitch black when those lights went out. The next few seconds were silent, but then I heard a, a window smash from the office. To understand this a little better too, let me quickly give you a layout of the house. So, when you entered the front door, to your left was the living room, straight ahead was both the kitchen and the stairs, and to the right was the office and the dining room. On the upstairs level, as soon as you reach the top of the stairs that is, my bathroom was straight ahead and my girlfriend's room was on the right and the other bedrooms were on the left. So, immediately I shot up and grabbed a kitchen knife. I ran upstairs to hide while I called the cops. I quickly got into my girlfriend's room and slipped into the closet and as soon as I was able to contact the operator, I heard the pounding of the intruder running up the steps. Thankfully, I had relayed all the information to the operator in time, who then stayed on the phone as we both remained quiet. The intruder took a left when he reached the top of the stairs, which gave more time for the cops to arrive and for me to get ready just in case I needed to defend myself. A few minutes go by until I heard the intruder start walking toward my girlfriend's room. In the only few precious seconds that I had, I slipped out of the closet and positioned myself next to the door. And as soon as he opened that door and started to enter the room, I took the kitchen knife and went straight for his shoulder. A young man screamed in pain as I heard a heavy metallic object make a large thud as it hit the ground. From there, I bolted out of the house where I was met by four squad cars and cops with their guns raised. I quickly threw my hands up shouting that he was upstairs in the right room. A few minutes go by and the intruder was eventually dragged out, still screaming in pain. 
With the siren lights flooding the street, I got a glimpse of this guy's face and it was Adam. I was informed later by an officer too that the metallic thud that I heard, it was actually a handgun that he had dropped. Adam was from Texas and had traveled up to my state to be with me apparently. He had rented a room at a local motel and would put letters in both my girlfriend's and my mailboxes daily. He would do this in the early hours of the morning, which was confirmed by the security footage of the motel that he was staying at. That night, Adam, he actually had plans to kill my girlfriend and her family, so I would apparently choose to be with him. He had managed to pry open the power box, then switch off the power to a house along with the neighboring houses, and broke in with the intent of her being there. And well... Unfortunately for him, she was enjoying a tropical vacation. To be honest, I have no idea how this outcome would be different if they didn't go on vacation. Maybe they would have stopped him, or maybe something else would have happened. I don't know, but I'm grateful that I still have my girlfriend as well as her family alive. And also, I'm very grateful that Adam is now locked up. This happened around 9 years ago when I was just 13 years old. Before I tell you what happened though, I think it would be good for you to understand the layout of my former house. We moved out after this. So, imagine the letter T and the inverted version of it, then join them together at the vertical line. The vertical line is the hallway and there are two rooms at the top facing each other, and at the bottom there is one bedroom and the bathroom facing each other, and there's my room between them facing the hallway. Now, I had always had a bit of a sleeping problem growing up, so I was wide awake at 3am like normal. I was watching the dark hallway like I usually do when I couldn't fall asleep. But on this particular night, I was more restless for some reason and felt like something was wrong. The feeling of uneasiness sat in the pit of my stomach for quite some time. It was like I was waiting for something horrifying to happen and it was inevitable. Anyway, while my unease was getting stronger and stronger and I could feel pain stemming from dread, I suddenly saw my mum walk out of the bedroom and towards the bathroom area. I must admit that when I saw her, I was overcome with relief too. I even heard the noise of the bathroom door handle. It was old and loose, so it made a bit of a sort of jingling sound. I got up and out of bed to talk to her so that I could thankfully calm myself down. But when I walked past the door frame and saw that the bathroom area was completely empty, I just sort of stood there frozen in place. Words can't even describe the horror that I felt, but I had goosebumps all over my body. I also felt like cold water was just splashed down my head. And I stood there, unable to turn my back to the dark hallway and glanced at the bedroom. And there I saw my mum and my dad sleeping peacefully, unaware of what had just happened. Somehow I found the strength to walk back to my bed, got under the covers while shaking from fear. I don't even really remember falling asleep, maybe I passed out from fear or something, I don't know, but to this day, even after nine years, I'm sure what I saw was identical to my mum. Her curly and shiny black hair was what made me feel sure that it was my mum. But what I failed to realize was that my mum didn't have a completely white set of pajamas, and whoever that was, that's what they were wearing. This is just one of the many things that happened to me and my family in that house, and it's not even limited to that place, too. It's like something always follows me. Even my sister witnessed it happening two or three times, too. I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea who that was or what even happened that Whatever it was, though, it really scared me. My wife and I travel pretty often, city to city, and at one point we settled down in Vegas for a few months. There was one night, too, where we were arguing after work about something, headed towards Henderson, city outside of Vegas, lots of isolated streets out that way, too. I was sitting reclined back in the passenger seat 
when we ran over something and the tire definitely popped. My wife got out to check and confirmed and within seconds a woman in a very nice car pulls up behind us. I saw that she was a woman and I laid back in the seat still mad, still stubborn and figuring that she was just checking on my wife assuming that she was alone. The woman said that she had a brother-in-law with a tow truck. He could definitely tow the car free of charge to a shop. My wife asked why she was being so kind and she said something like, my sister's got to stick together, I'm helping you out. She then got back in the car and my wife told me that she was going to follow us with her hazards on to this empty and dark parking lot in front of some grocery store apparently nearby to get us out of the road. I still didn't think it was weird at all. My wife was very confident that this woman was genuine and just really wanted to help us. So we pull into the parking lot and my wife gets out. I'm still laying back and this woman doesn't even know that I'm here yet. She starts talking to my wife about how she changed her life within a year. She could put her on to what she does. It seems believable to be honest. She looks really nice and her car was definitely expensive. My wife keeps insisting that she can just call a tow truck. She felt bad that she was taking her time, but we could afford it. But this woman, she just kept insisting that her brother-in-law was coming. Be patient. He really doesn't mind. She even offered at some point to drive my wife around the area looking for a shop that was open, but my wife had already googled some places. She told her that's smart and they kept talking. No suspicion, honestly. But she then starts asking my wife why she's in Vegas. We had New York plates. She says for adventure and doing something new and blah blah blah. The woman asks if she has family she's close to or maybe a boyfriend. She could introduce her to some friends to help her get well acquainted or something like that. She motions over to me and says, well, I have a husband. And the this woman, she honestly looked like a deer in headlights. I politely waved. She leans over and finally sees me, stares for a few seconds, and then just immediately gets in her car, instantly. I've never seen anyone look at me like that too, like she had to get away from me or something. She tells my wife that she has to go to a store that's opening soon. Her brother-in-law is taking too long, but he'll be there in like an hour at least. She told her not to leave, that he was going to come and help, well, one hour. My wife was really confused and tried to ask if she'd be there too, but the woman just drove off. We knew then that something was wrong too with that situation, and we both just sort of stared at each other in confusion. I have no idea still why that happened, but we called a towing company and fixed the car within like 40 minutes, Drove back to wait because my wife was persistent in believing that this woman was going to come back or her brother-in-law would and she wanted to let them know that she didn't need their help. I told her that I really don't think that they're coming back but we did wait. No one came too for like nearly two hours before we drove home and I did some research and found out apparently a lot of traffickers use women because they seem more trustworthy Vegas obviously has a large presence of these things as well, and the woman was almost desperate to keep my wife there for some reason. It was all just really weird and gave me some really creepy vibes, that's for sure. These days when I look back, it seems more obvious that there was danger there, but in the moment, the woman was just so charming and endearing that it seemed like she was genuinely trying to help. To be honest, I, I'm still not 100% sure what happened that night, but... I'm pretty sure that she ran off because I was there and she didn't anticipate a man being there. So I guess you could say that I found out why people don't pick up hitchhikers now. So as I was driving from Texas to Cali, around an hour after I started my drive, I saw this guy with his dog on Route 66 in the middle of nowhere, at least three miles away from even the nearest gas station. It's cold and I wasn't in a rush, so I decided to ask him if he wanted a ride. Turns out that he was trying to go to a city in Arizona that was like only 20 miles off of my route, so I offered to let him join the trip. He was chill, seemed normal enough, and... Looked like he cared for his dog. 
His original story was that he started walking in Mississippi after some reason. He lost his job and everything went down the drain, so he walked or hitched to Texas where he got stuck for like three months and was trying to get to his mum so she could help him out. I bought him some food after asking if he ate, which he said that he hadn't. And so them good deed endorphins are hitting just right at this moment and I feel like I'm doing a good thing. After around 200 miles though, he tells me that he just called his mum while I was refilling my gas and apparently she went to LA for a vacation so he would just ride with me until I got to Cali. Okay, kind of weird I suppose and sporadic but I didn't pay too much mind. We chatted and again seemed pretty normal until we got to Arizona that is. He starts bringing up Trump and how the election was stolen and all sorts of weird conspiracy theories which was obviously a red flag, but I just ask him to drop it as I don't like to talk about politics anyway. He then asks if I could just drop him off at his, quote, two girlfriends at his house, which he got after his mum passed, and he inherited a town in Arizona. He said that he called beforehand and they are expecting him after three months. He also mentions almost like nothing during an earlier convo that he has mild schizophrenia. Obviously not much of that made sense, but I started putting it all together. I don't think he even has a coherent goal of what he's doing, so when we get to Arizona finally, and we're in the last 10 miles to his now one girlfriend, which he claims that he loves, I start to wonder, am I about to drop a mentally ill man off two states away in the middle of nowhere, where it's about to get freezing? Oh, and a uh, plot twist too, I didn't even notice at first, but apparently he wasn't even using a real phone. He didn't even have one. Anyway, as we got to his girlfriend's house, I told him, Hey man, do you want me to wait here just in case she isn't home or something? Thinking that I could at least talk him into letting me drop him off to a nearby homeless shelter or something. And exactly what I thought would happen, happened. He said, I guess I got the wrong info and she doesn't live there. My other family members live there though. Yeah, let's just go to Cali to see my mum. As he sat down in the car, which I've now been driving with him for like over nine hours I think, I told him that maybe, maybe he isn't in the best mental state at the moment and his mental illness can be playing tricks with him. And upon saying that, Man, he totally flipped out out of nowhere and said that if I bring up his schizophrenia ever again that he was going to kill me. He wasn't really threatening at all though, so I simply said, Bro, I don't feel comfortable driving you to Cali, but I don't want to leave you and your dog in the about to be freezing cold. Do you at least want me to drop you off at a homeless shelter or something? And then he just swore and said, I'll just walk to Cali myself. Mind you, he said this in the mountain town of Arizona where it's about to get freezing cold. He has no money, no food, no water, with at least 10 miles down a pretty uninhabited road. And I'm pretty sure that he didn't have family that lived in that house that he went to. And he just ended up leaving with his dog and I sat there dumbfounded and then left as there was nothing more that I could really have done at this point. I don't know where this guy ended up in the end, but man, I hope that he's safe and getting some help because that guy, I feel sorry for him. I used to live in a fairly small town where there wasn't really much to do as a teenager. One of the things that I learned to enjoy from my parents was visiting antique stores and looking at all of the interesting old things. My senior year of high school, I went to this large antique store or sort of flea market and I came across a Ouija board that was probably from the 70s or the, maybe the 80s, I would guess. I was a pretty skeptical agnostic, I guess you could call me at the time, and thought that it would be a bit of fun to sort of do it with friends. And nothing really crazy happened except that I had my first instance of sleep paralysis around that time. The next year though, I went to college and I brought it with me. 
and my friend and I convinced some girls from his dorm to try out the Ouija board in a small cemetery on campus with the old landowners from like the early 1800s. That night I stashed the board under my bed and I went to sleep like normal. But as I was dozing off I kept seeing images of like skulls flying towards me. Almost like in that pre-dream in between awake and asleep visual state if you've ever experienced that. Anyway, I woke up suddenly from a nightmare around 3am and had the strangest feeling of being sort of partially paralyzed and then sort of released. It's hard to describe how I know this, but it felt as if there were like two long arms that lifted off of me and went under each side of my bed. It really creeped me out and I looked under my bed and, and I remembered that the Ouija board was down there and so I didn't want to be alone. I was going to go to the 24-hour campus library. As I was leaving, my neighbor from across the hall came out of his room and I told him about the experience and he said that he would be willing to walk around the room with a picture of the Virgin Mary that was supposedly blessed by a holy man in Mexico. Obviously, I was a bit wary of that, being skeptical and agnostic like I was, but I figured, you know what, it couldn't hurt since I was so creeped out next day I gave the board to that neighbor. I was glad to be rid of it to be honest and eventually I just forgot all about it. A couple of years later I was in a bar with some friends though when who should I see but my old neighbor. After we caught up a bit he said hey do you remember that Ouija board that you gave me? Yeah well I took it back home and I gave it to my mum, and she said that some weird things like lights turning on and off and hearing voices had been happening ever since she got it and eventually she actually burned it. That was weird to say the least and upon reflection that, that year of my life when I had that board was actually a pretty bad year. Obviously I'm still pretty skeptical but more open minded about the supernatural after this experience for sure. And I guess that's why I definitely don't want to be playing with any more Ouija boards. So I'm a clinician in a psychiatric hospital. I work with all kinds of people. I diagnose them by doing an assessment. And essentially I find out why they're seeking help. I've always heard tales too of schizophrenics somehow being sort of privy to a different world through their hallucinations. But before I get to that, let me back up a bit. So I've read that schizophrenics can see our world in the layers that we cannot. I'd never believed it until I had a few experiences. One in particular too. Before I was a clinician, I was a mental health tech. I looked after patients and put them in physical holds when they were endangering themselves or others. And one day, this guy Aaron, who had been fine all week, suddenly began responding to internal or external stimuli. He ran out of his room and broke a microwave, screamed like a banshee, and went into his room. I went into his room where he leaped at me from a chair. He grabbed my shirt and said, Okay, I'm going to wear your body and we'll drive your car too. When I'm done with your body, I'll cover it in leaves. I calmly removed his hands from my neck and shoulders and I escorted him into a safe room, which is what it sounds like really. A room where only he resides and we keep an eye on him with a camera. But as he sat on the bed, he suddenly blurted out, You haven't talked to your dad in six years and you have a brother who is missing in California. And at that, my blood instantly ran cold and I became sort of lightheaded because I really hadn't talked to my dad in like six years. And yes, my brother was missing, presumably in California somewhere. To say that I was a little spooked is a bit of an understatement. So uh, I recently uh, heard of this book called An Amazing Journey into the Psychic Mind that deals with the phenomenon of auditory and visual hallucination. I haven't read it yet, but every schizophrenic that I've come across tells me, when they want to, that is, about hearing a voice. It can give commands and come from the television or a radio or just continuously play in their head. It can tell them that no one likes them and all sorts of other things. Or it can say some really strange things like, no one likes you, your pants are terrible, 
no one loves you because, well, your pants are foolish. Stuff like that. This book, though, apparently looks at the world of these hallucinations and wonders if these hallucinations are actually a negative entity alive somewhere in the world that is tormenting certain people. I don't know if I believe this, but I've been privy to psychotic people saying things to people that they should really not be able to know. And so all of this has my interest peaked and I guess I just wanted to share this story because it's something that stuck with me ever since it happened. During the beginning of my freshman year, one of my teachers was actually having some health problems, so we had subs most days. This happened a few months after she came back. So one day, my dad was in the grocery store and I was waiting outside for him. I was sitting on a bench when one of the subs that we had came up to me. There was a gym across the street and he looked like he'd just come from it as he was wearing workout clothes and was holding a large duffel bag. He knew my name and started talking to me about school. Me being young and naive, I just thought that he was being friendly and didn't really realize anything was off. After a while, he sat down on the bench and got really close to me. We had been talking about a book that I was reading for school and then he started telling me that he had a signed copy of it in his car and that he would really like to show it to me. I know that I'm stupid, but at that point, I still didn't really think anything was off. He kept on mentioning his car and that he needed to drop his bag off, but he'd really like to continue the conversation and I could walk with him. About 20 minutes into the conversation, I would say. I know, it should have been a red flag. I mean, what teacher talks to a student in public for that long? But my dad finally came out and freaked out when he saw some random middle-aged man talking to his teenage daughter. When the sub saw my dad, he introduced himself as my teacher, but then sort of left really hurriedly. Somehow at that point too, I still didn't feel that off. Until a week later when I was reading the book that we had been talking about, and something just clicked. I started freaking out a bit because, well, he was huge, like well over six feet tall, and he could have easily overpowered me if he got me into his car. Plus, we were mostly by ourselves in the car park. Also, he could have had anything in that duffel bag. I think the final thing that confirmed his intentions, though, was when a few weeks later I had stayed after school to talk to a teacher and was sort of taking a shortcut through one of the campus buildings. I was the only one in the hallway and looked into one of the classrooms and saw him. We made eye contact and he yelled my name and at that, I just started running down the hallway as quickly as I could and he started screaming at me to wait that he needed to talk to me. I didn't stop running though until I was a few blocks away from the school and after that, this guy just literally disappeared off the face of the planet. I, nor anyone, never really saw him again and... His whole disappearance was really strange. I really wanted to report him, but I actually had no idea what his name was. None of my friends did, and after we sort of asked around a bit, no one seemed to have this guy's name. I feel especially bad about this, though, because what if, what if this guy's done this to others since then? I don't know. I guess one silver lining of online school is, as a sub... He's probably out of a job, and the lockdown would make it harder for him to do that to others, I suppose. That is, if he was actually a teacher to begin with. My name is Luke, and I'm now 20 years old, but this story, it took place when I was 17. So, this experience... I'm still pretty perplexed by it, but it gives me chills to this day. In May of 2017, I found myself going out a lot more on my mountain bike. I was just getting bored of cruising around the streets too, so I wanted to go for a, like a trail or woodland bike ride. I had never been to Lay Woods before then, and personally I don't think I'll ever be going alone again, but... After some research into a few different areas, Lay Woods seemed to be my best bet. 
living, living only a couple of miles away, it was a pretty nice bike ride. On arrival, it looked really peaceful and I was almost in a dreamlike state by my first look at the place. For a woodland area in England, let alone Bristol, it was pretty much amazing. On going into the woods, I remembered seeing different colours at the start of each trail, sort of signifying difficulty for bikers and length for walkers and whatnot. Don't take my word for it though, because I still really don't know what they meant. But I decided to go down a coloured, I can't remember very well, I think it was blue, trail, to see how it was there. Finding it exciting, I decided to go down the harder trail, and here's where it starts to get a little bit weird. So I began getting this weird feeling and I began looking around as if I was being followed by the woodlands itself. Everything all of a sudden felt like it was getting bigger and further away too, which was weird. But I brushed it off and it turns out that I actually completely lost track of time. I got lost on the trail too, but bear in mind, I'm very observant and aware of my surroundings before this trail. But I then came to a sort of strange opening. I could go left into this rough direction of the way out or right deeper into the woods I think. Me being me I decided to just go deeper into the woods. I came to a sort of weird little trail that just had dodgy written all over it. I went against my gut feeling of turning back and went down there. I came to a point of which the trail continued but it was actually getting pretty dangerous. The trail being too bumpy for me to even walk down I eventually just turned back. But for a few minutes before turning back, I don't know why, but I was just sort of stood still staring down the trail. I just felt like I was being watched from all angles, even though it would be near impossible to have done that. Anyway, I got nervous and began walking back up the hill as I was too tired to ride at this point. But keep in mind too, my bike tires are completely solid no punctures, slow punctures, or even anything wrong at all. I wish I still had pictures of the bike too, but... Anyway, upon getting back to the spot where I originally went to the trail, this weird loss of time thing happened. It felt as if the whole path had stretched by like half a mile, as if the woodland was moving or something. I began walking up the path, feeling that same eerie sensation of being watched as I did beforehand. But this time... It felt a bit more sinister. It felt as if something was about to happen. Bearing in mind, I hadn't seen a single person at this point in time since I went down that first trail. I'll explain the scenery though before continuing. So, it's a long path, a slight steep hill to my left, a very narrow river to my right. Maybe four feet deep, maybe four feet wide as well. There's bushes on either side of the river with the odd tree every now and then. And upon getting about maybe a quarter of the way up the slowly inclining path, I then all of a sudden hear a woman crying from behind a tree up ahead. I start slowing down my walking pace to try and get a good look behind the tree, but the whole time I'm thinking to myself, why would someone jump across to cry behind a tree? So I edge closer to the river to look behind to see if the person is okay. Also because many people go to Lay Woods to end their lives and such, so I was hoping maybe to help this person or something. But you guessed it. When I got there, there was no one there and the crying just suddenly stopped. A bit weirded out by this, obviously, I just sort of slowly turn away and I start walking again, a bit quicker now as I was pretty unnerved. I've had paranormal experiences before but never in a place like the woods like this. It's usually in a house or some sort of a building or something and definitely never anything as uh, acute as that I suppose. So this whole thing was really new to me and I had this sudden shiver though as I was walking and maybe a minute or so later only a couple of meters away from where I had heard the crying it started up again, but this time it was right opposite me across the river. I didn't bother looking this time, I started to go into a bit of a jog and as I got faster I heard the bushes rustling as if they or whatever it was was following me. Upon hearing this I quickly sped up and the crying became more and more hysterical. 
But bear in mind too that my bike was fine before this moment in time. I thought to myself, you know what, screw this, I'm gone. So I went to hop onto my bike with the adrenaline that was rushing through me and I came to an almost sudden stop. My back tire on my bike had become completely flat all of a sudden. So I had no other choice but to just sprint with my bike and pray for the best that I don't trip up or end up having to throw it to run faster or something. With the crying person still close to me and keeping up, I'm running faster and faster praying that I get off this path that I was on. I was almost in tears at this point because I couldn't actually do anything to help the situation or get out of it faster, but after what felt like, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes of running, I could finally see the car park. The crying had stopped following me and getting closer and sort of started moving back to where I first heard it, I think. I wasn't about to hang around to find out though, so I sprinted out into the car park. I must have been as white as a sheet of paper and hysterical with my breathing and wheezing because multiple people in the car park turned to look at me like I was crazy. I saw the exit sign out of the car park and I just ran towards it. But while doing so, I noticed that my bike it was moving a lot smoother all of a sudden. I stopped to take a quick look and I could hardly believe it, but... My bike tire, it had suddenly regained all of its air and it was solid again, as it was before the unnerving crying person shenanigans. I jumped off my bike and I got away from those woods as fast as I could and since then I, I've never been back. But the thing that makes this really scary is that I have Irish heritage and in Irish folklore there's a demon woman called the Banshee. She's apparently seen in woodlands next to rivers and lakes, washing blood off of clothes. It's said that if you see her washing blood off of clothes, the person who owns those clothes will die. Alternatively, if you hear her crying, it means death apparently. I can't remember the meanings exactly of the deaths, but it means either you or a loved one will die, I think. Anyway, I don't know about all of that, but since 2017, I... I've lost my auntie and two of my best friends and a dog as well, in a sort of streak of bad luck I suppose, but I can't help but think about this when I reflect on it all. Lay Woods is no joke, that's for sure. There are many stories that have come up out of those woods. You can read online about them if you want. All you have to do is search up Bristol Haunting and Lay Woods and stuff like that and it should come up. Apparently it's rated like the 87th most haunted place in the UK according to some places. Anyway, like I said, I haven't been back there ever since and I'm not planning to and I hope that you enjoyed the story. So this happened to my roommate earlier today. For context, she just recently started working at a clothing store and it's within like walking distance from our place. We don't live in a terrible area too, but she's very small and pretty adorable, so I do worry about her, especially after listening to so many of the terrifying encounters here. But anyway, her name is Sarah and at around 5pm today I got a call from her and she sounded like she was panicking. She kept just saying over and over again, please pick me up. I calmed her down and asked her what had happened and apparently while she was working two men walked in that immediately gave her the creeps. They were significantly larger than herself and wore all black clothes with hoodies pulled up and literally just textbook bad guy clothes. As Sarah was stocking items in the men's section these two men approached that same section and start meandering the aisles but her eyes kept darting around the store as if they were nervous or they were looking for someone. One of them looked directly at Sarah before nudging his buddy and saying something in his ear. Starting to get officially weirded out too, she began walking toward another department to continue her work. As she walked past the men, she heard one of them quietly say to the other, Did you do it yet? Unsure of what it was, she did her best to put a good amount of distance between her and them and continued restocking. After a few minutes, she looked up to where they had been in the men's section and they were no longer there. She looked around and it looked as if she'd actually left the store, so she felt a little bit relieved by that. That relief, though, was very short-lived. 
After about five minutes, she began to get a really strong feeling that someone was staring at her. She quickly turned around to find that one of the men was standing directly across the aisle from her, holding his phone up in a way that made it very obvious that he was taking photos of her. As soon as they made eye contact, he turned around and sped walked out of the store as though he knew that he'd been caught. Sarah immediately filed a report of the entire encounter to the store security guard, and he did a sweep of the store to see if the other man was still there. He had taken off too, and neither of them could be seen in the parking lot, so the security guard just took note of their appearances, and that was it. But having read about how human traffickers will sometimes take photos of their victims before attempting to abduct them, honestly, it was pretty terrifying. I wish that I could have been there with her all day at work to make sure that whoever these guys didn't come back, but the best that I could do for now is drive Sarah to and from work every day. There's no way that I'm going to let her leave that store alone and risk getting picked up off the street or something. All I can say is that I really hope that those guys may never come back. In my childhood home, I've had plenty of unnerving things happen that I never really tried to dwell on too much, mainly because it was just a, a brief glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. But plenty of weird sounds mostly of a woman either singing or saying someone's name or something. I had three older siblings too who also experienced stuff like this pretty regularly, but we never got too spooked about it. The only instance that still gives me chills to this day is when me and my fiancé moved back into my childhood home to get away from a bad living situation that we were in. It's just me, her, and our dog. When we move in and everything seems to be pretty much fine... Nothing too crazy happens, just the usual stuff. Until one night when I was in the kitchen playing with the dog and I took off running to our laundry room area with my dog hot on my heels chasing me. You know, just having some stupid fun. I faced the opening and I just stopped dead in my tracks, along with my dog. The opening to the laundry room was pretty big. Had about maybe an 8 foot high opening and probably 8 foot wide as well. I look up in the top right hand corner and I see this thing's head. Now, this is not something that I just caught a glimpse of too. I made eye contact with this thing and it was peeking out of the top right hand corner just looking at me and my dog. The best way that I know how to describe it is sort of how a, a mannequin looks. The bald ones, but bright white with no nose, big solid black eyes and a mouth just full of something like shark teeth. When it first emerged, I actually didn't see its teeth, but as I looked at it, its mouth opened and I saw them. That's when my dog just proceeds to take off and, believe me, I was right behind him. This all happened in the span of maybe 10 or 15 seconds. I obviously had to go back there at some point, but when I did, there was nothing there. We've since moved out of that place, but I've lived there for maybe a year after that, and my dog refused to go near the laundry room after that too. I know it's kind of hard to believe this, and trust me, I'd be skeptical too if I didn't see it with my own eyes, but... I just wanted to share my experience and maybe see if someone else has had a similar run-in with whatever this thing is, or maybe you guys know what it was. I was 11, almost turning 12, and my family decided to go to America for a holiday where we stayed in Las Vegas for a few days at the Stratosphere Hotel. The hotel is split between hotel rooms and a large casino that we would sometimes had to walk through to get out of the hotel. And one night, my parents had to go and do something and they told me to just wait there. Pretty stupid of them, I know. But it had been quite a while and they still hadn't returned. Later on, a black woman, probably in her late 20s, she approached me and asked me if I could accompany her in the elevator because she had a fear of them. My first thought as a naive 11 year old was, oh, of course, as I loved being a helping hand to other people. However, 
I wanted to tell my parents where I had gone so that they didn't have to worry where I went when they came back. So I told this lady and then went on a quest to find my parents in this Vegas casino alone. Not really sure where they had gone, but wanting to find them fast because I didn't want to keep the lady waiting. I couldn't find my parents anywhere though, so I decided to go back and accompany this lady anyway since I had nothing better to do and would probably be back before my parents got back. But, to my dismay, when I returned, she had gone. Soon after, my parents had finally come back, and after telling them, they explained that she was most likely going to try and kidnap me, but left because I said that I would tell my parents. In retrospect, I find it completely stupid to leave an 11-year-old alone in a Las Vegas casino for like 20 plus minutes. It was a recipe for disaster and Lord knows what would have happened had that lady still been there. Growing up, I lived in a small two-bedroom apartment in California. It was me, my two younger brothers, my mum and her boyfriend. My siblings and I, we shared one room and my mum and her boyfriend, they had the other room. This apartment, as far as I'm concerned, it was haunted. It all started with one night in particular that led to other occurrences over time. The smiling woman is just one example. So, to start... There was this one night when I woke up sometime in the middle of the night. There was no reason for me to be waking up like that. And I was about to lay back down and go back to sleep when suddenly I heard a deep man's voice say, Run, really fast, followed by silence. Now, it couldn't have been one of my brothers because they're both actually autistic and non-verbal. I looked around the room though, which was pitch dark except for the street lamps outside couldn't find the source of the voice. No TVs were on and it wasn't a neighbor because I literally heard it next to my ear. I turned my TV on after that and didn't get much sleep for the rest of the night. On another occasion my mum was brushing her hair and she heard a small child laughing in the hallway outside of her bedroom and then what sounded like a sort of low rhythmic humming sound. She was the only one inside the apartment at the time so she checked the hall and found video games strewn all over the floor leading into the living room. My mum tried to tell her boyfriend about it, but he was always really skeptical. He was skeptical initially until he himself had quite possibly the most terrifying experience out of pretty much all of us. So, my mum was picking me and my brothers up from school and he was home alone. He was watching football when, out of nowhere, he heard my mum's voice calling for him in their bedroom. He was obviously confused by this because she had not come through the front door at all and he should have seen her come in. Thinking that she had somehow gotten in without him noticing, he went into her room to investigate and when he got to the edge of the door, he saw a woman standing at the bedroom window with her back turned. Thinking that she had somehow gotten in without him noticing, he went into their room to investigate and when he got to the edge of the door he saw a woman standing at the bedroom window with her back turned. She had a long silk red dress on, he said, and when she turned around, she had a really weird and wide grin on her face and tears welled up in her eyes. He said that he screamed at her to get out, thinking that she was some sort of an intruder or something. And then he noticed that she was sort of transparent, like he could see the window through her body, and then just like that... She just disappeared. That night we got home to him walking around the house with Sage, screaming at whoever it was to leave. We didn't know what was going on at first and it really freaked us out. Other sort of small occurrences have happened too, like lights turning on by themselves and once I literally felt a cold hand grab me around my neck. It's been about 15 years though and I've since moved out of state and haven't had a paranormal encounter since leaving that apartment. I've pretty much grown up with paranormal things happening though so it's something that I do accept. And I have way too many stories to include them all here but if anyone would care to hear more about anything really then please comment below and let me know and I'll see what else I can share. Anyway, thanks for listening.
So I drove out to the Blackhead National Forest yesterday as a kind of day trip with my friend. We stopped at this spot with trailheads along a sort of creek and river. Now this state has weird ideas of what a creek and a river is, so who knows what it actually is, but it was fun and things were going pretty great. We found a waterfall and decided to go a little off trail to see the tiny creek that fed it. Not far at all. But we were looking at this sort of itty bitty creek that was mostly swallowed by leaves and and I felt like I needed to look up the stream a bit, but not at the stream, just in that direction. And I saw something about maybe 50 feet away. At first I thought it was a bird sitting on a table. It was very white or sort of light tan. Stood out amongst the grey surrounding of the bare trees though. And the moment that I saw it, I kind of froze. To be honest too, I felt like I needed to just turn around and go back the way that I came ASAP. I'm looking at it and realise that it's not moving at all. Like it's completely still. The increasing feeling of danger and go away vibes continue. I pointed it out to my friend and he said, Yeah, I don't think we're supposed to be up here. But I had to pee so I went real quick while facing this thing just in case it was something that would run up on me. I started to reason with myself that it must just be a, a bit of bare dirt or dead wood sticking out from something or weird or something. But I just couldn't shake this feeling that I was getting. Anyway, we head back down the edge to the trail and I have that feeling like there's something right behind you that's going to get you. Sort of like when you run up the stairs in the dark when you're little and you just feel like something is sort of on your tail. Anyway, as a note, I always pay attention to when things are extra silent around me in nature. I know my presence can make things go a little bit quiet because, well, technically I'm a predator, but this is the subtropics. The woods are never dead or silent in the winter or any time, basically. It's just sort of no longer obnoxiously loud. I noticed that when we were up there that I couldn't even really hear the waterfall that went off the edge about maybe five feet away from us. No bird sounds, just nothing. And these trees are tall so often the birds just go up to the top branches and yell their alarm calls to each other but there was none of this. I don't even recall seeing any life the entire time that I was out there. No fish, no insects. No flies, which was really weird. I even gently dug into some of the water spots to see if there was anything there because I think that stuff is cool, but there was nothing. Very weird. So, we're walking away from this waterfall and as soon as we go around this rock where we wouldn't be able to see the waterfall anymore if we turned around, I didn't have that something is right behind me feeling anymore. Like, at all. We had to turn back around though because we were a few feet off trail and it kind of dead ended at the sort of drop off back down to the trail. When we go back down around the rock, I instantly feel it again. But this time, it's immediately in front of me. That's where this waterfall is too. I don't feel it from the waterfall per se, but from the ledge above. It's like someone dangerous is watching me from up there, but I can't see anything. Anyway, I know it's super weird, but we go down the trail and we just continue on. The whole way I hear branches snapping and stuff. It sounds like something human-sized at the smallest, but it's coming from the ledge above that overlooks the trail and the river creek that it winds along. The bad vibes the whole way. We see some sort of structure along the trail that had a fallen tree that had taken it down, so my friend says, okay, we got to at least go that far. I agreed because I didn't feel bad vibes from that spot. But we pass it and there's another creek leading to the river thing. Just like the one with the waterfall that is. The trail winds back a bit up the stream and then comes back out. I suppose it's a way for them to build smaller bridges maybe and there's less erosion up there or something. I say I don't want to go any further though because I don't like the vibes back there. He agrees too and we kind of hang there for a minute. But then we hear people or something off in the distance. I don't feel right about it either. 
Granted, I had some sketchy experiences with property owners years ago on a river in northern Tennessee, so I think maybe that's why I feel weird. I'm trying to talk myself down from the concern, I suppose, but I still have my guard up and I'm staying situationally aware, that's for sure. I'm kind of keeping my head on a swivel while still enjoying the beauty of nature. So we start heading back and I'm getting an increasing feeling of this thing is going to get us or me. It's still on the ridgeline coming back with us, but it's like slightly ahead, I think. Branches cracking, sounds of water. Not near the waterfall too, but trickling and splashing like that when I didn't hear it there on the way in. I keep looking back up because I just know that there's something there, but I can't see anything. The creepy feeling though keeps getting worse and worse and we eventually pass this waterfall and there's some old ladies at a picnic bench. They say hi, I talk to them briefly about their dog, Lee. She has her dog and says hi and he does a sort of cute bark. I love dogs but I didn't stop this whole time that I was talking to them because I just didn't trust anything that was happening at that point. I even for some weird reason questioned whether they were real or not. The dog seemed normal enough though. Anyway, I keep going and I'm feeling a little bit better, like this thing backed off a bit. But still, I want to get the heck out of there and we get back to the trailhead where we parked and my friend saw the first sign of life, a fly, finally. Also, there were finally bird noises, which I was very grateful to hear. We get into the truck and leave, and I just felt like it was a movie. Like the camera would zoom in on the ridgeline as we were leaving to show something or someone was watching us. But anyway, we drove around a few more places, checked out a small lake, and made our way back eventually. I didn't feel right still, and I just felt really drained. Like, just exhausted from the hike, which was a very intense one, but like mentally and emotionally drained too. Somewhere along the trip too, I sort of looked at the time and when I looked at it, I could hardly believe my eyes because now it was way later in the day and there's just no way that it should have been. Anyway, it was a, a really weird day and I'm not sure what the heck that was or of what happened and why we lost all that time. But if anyone has any ideas of what happened or what that thing was, then please, do let me know. To many people, keeping your arms and legs under the blankets keeps the monsters under your bed. To many, sleeping with your back to a wall keeps the monsters inside the closet. But sometimes, the monsters don't follow the rules. I was about nine years old when everything began. My sister and I were still sharing a bedroom. We each had a twin-sized bed. Mine was in the southwest corner next to the closet and just across from the door. And my sister's was the corner opposite mine. Both our beds pointed towards the door. Our house was your typical 60s style house, two floors and a basement with dark wood paneling on the walls. The top floor had three bedrooms and two bathrooms. My parents' bedroom had the walk-in closet and a larger bathroom. The two other closets had the sort of sliding doors and not much room inside. But my sister and I, we shared the bathroom in the upstairs hallway as well. And as most children do, we feared the utility room in the basement. Sometimes we would hear creaking from the furnace or creaking in the walls and our first thought was ghosts. Most of the time though, that's all it was, just a, a creaky old house. Until this one time that it wasn't. So this night was just like any other. I always had trouble falling asleep as a kid, still do. My sister and I, we slept with our bedroom door open. The bathroom we shared was just around the corner in a short hallway I was laying there on my bed, just looking up at the ceiling, telling myself stories until I would finally fall asleep, as I had done pretty much every night before this one. And then I heard something sort of messing around in the bathroom's trash can. I knew it wasn't Diamond, our blonde shih tzu, even at that age. I knew she was too proud of a dog to sort of go around in children's trash, but I laid there wondering what it could have been. 
but my imagination ran wild about ghosts that we believed in in our basement, and the next morning I told my parents and my sister what I'd heard. Of course, they all dismissed it as the dog in the trash, even though we all know better. But it happened several more times over the following few weeks. Each time I would tell my parents and my sister, each time my parents would dismiss it as how proud Shih Tzu, but my sister, only eight at the time, became less and less convinced that it was the dog though. Perhaps my arguments that Diamond never had any interest in the trash during the day was starting to make sense to her. Now, this part is something that I've sort of tried to repress to be honest. Because my sister claims that one night I decided to get up and find out what it was that was digging through our trash can. I never described it to her but apparently I told her that I was going to look at it and declared the next morning that it was not in fact our little shih tzu. This was again met with, oh it's just your imagination from our parents and my sister and I, we just let it go. After all, it never caused us any harm and it didn't seem to be doing anything other than messing around with the trash can. Except for scaring me so much that I can no longer recall going into the bathroom that night. I don't know. Weird, I know, but anyway. The bathroom creature continued to sort of shuffle around in there irregularly for the next few weeks. And during this time, my parents decided to repaint our room using a technique they saw on HGTV. But they let us pick the colors. I chose purple, and my sister chose a reddish sort of pink color. Now, this technique was going to take a couple of days for my parents to finish, so we helped them move our dressers, nightstands, and bookcase out of our bedroom and into the spare room. We took apart the bed frames and moved them into the spare room too. The only pieces of furniture left were the guinea pig stand and our mattress, which we made up with blankets to sleep on for the time being. My parents started painting, and first they primed it, then they let that dry and air out so my sister and I could sleep safely for the night. The next day, they started using a sponge to apply the pink and the purple colors that my sister and I had chosen in sort of artful flowers, if that's the right word, all over the walls, one wall at a time. Each afternoon, they would open the windows and turn on the fans to get rid of the paint fumes. They'd move our mattresses back into place and we would go to bed. It took several days for it to be completed, but the second to the last night, my sister and I were supposed to sleep in our mattresses. It took several days for it to be completed, but the second to the last night, my sister and I, we were supposed to sleep on our mattresses, and we were both a little bit sad that we only had a couple of nights left to do this. The novelty of our current sleeping arrangements had not yet worn off, but we went to bed, and I once again found myself laying there, unable to sleep, trying to tell myself stories and count sheep. A couple of hours passed, I would say, and I heard my parents come up the stairs and go to their room for the night. I could see the light of their TV bouncing off the walls of the hallway. Diamond had decided to sleep with us for the night and came into our room, jumping onto my sister's mattress opposite mine. About another hour passed, I would guess, and my parents turned their TV off. I sighed as I sort of rolled over onto my left side, putting my back to the small gap between my mattress and the wall, I looked out the window at the neighbor's house and remembered all the times that they would let us use their pool and I started hearing a sort of slight clicking sound coming from downstairs. This sound was definitely new as well. It was as if someone was tapping a pen on the hardwood floors in the kitchen or something. I ignored it. I'd never heard it before but it was an old house like I said. It creaked. Several more hours passed this was going to be another sleepless night. I considered getting up and having my mum make me some warm milk again, but I never got the chance. Because, all of a sudden, there was a snort from directly behind me, between my back and the wall. Instinct took over and my body just completely froze in place. I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, felt goosebumps on my folded arms. I faced the room, my back to the wall. There was a small gap, maybe a foot at most, between my mattress and the wall, and something was definitely now occupying that gap near the top of the mattress. It continued snorting as well, like a, a warthog. I could hear it sniffing our carpet and snort as if it sniffed my mattress. 
It even felt like it nudged the mattress with its nose at one point. I didn't dare move though. This was definitely not our dog. And whatever it was, it made its way down the wall towards our open bedroom door. I thought that maybe it was about to leave. Maybe it would go back into the bathroom and go away. I prayed that it would, to be honest. I feared that it could hear my heart pounding on my chest and was about to do something to me. It got to the end of my mattress, but it didn't go through the open door. Instead, it turned and the end of my mattress suddenly compressed under a weight. I pulled my feet towards my chest, away from this thing, terrified of it touching me. I felt it sniff the mattress with whatever it used as a nose, snorting the whole time. Slowly, it pulled itself up onto the mattress, closer and closer to me. I couldn't pull my feet up any closer to my head, and I started breathing heavily, fearing that this could be the end. But then, all of a sudden, it just pulled away. It smoothly slid off the mattress, and I heard the snorting fade as it left our room. I don't know where it went. I didn't get up to follow it. But soon, that clicking noise started up again in our kitchen below us. I could hear it reverberating up our stairwell, and I tried to get some sleep, but I didn't get pretty much any that night. When I woke up, I told my family the next day. To my exasperation, I was met with the same indifference as always. But my sister stopped eating her breakfast and just sort of stared at me, her blue eyes wide in her freckled face. She chimed in that she had heard snorting last night too, but thought that she might have been dreaming or something. Anyway, the next night came and my sister and I settled into our beds, wondering what fresh horror tonight would bring. We both lay there awake. Our parents came up to bed about an hour after we did. We could see the glow of their TV bouncing down the short hallway like normal. A couple of hours later, they turned off their TV and Diamond came into our room to sleep with us. I heard her soft footfalls as she jumped onto my sister's mattress. Are you awake? I whispered into the darkness. Yeah, came the reply. We waited there for what felt like, I don't know, hours, but eventually I heard it. The clicking noises downstairs again, as if someone was tapping a, a plastic pen against our hardwood floor in the kitchen. But then, my body froze up again, and my hair stood up. I lay facing the room, and it was behind me again. But this time, it wasn't snorting so loudly. But it did sniff my mattress again, sniff the wall, sniff the carpet. But without the snorting, though, I could hear something heavy sliding across the carpet floor between my mattress and the wall. It reached the end of my mattress, and... I felt it pushing at the corner with its nose, I think. I hissed at my sister, but she didn't answer. I looked towards her mattress and very slowly propped my head up into my hand. I glanced at the foot of my bed and it was dark, but with the nightlight in the hallway and from the street lamp outside of our window, I could see what I can only describe as a large black sort of snake-like mass slithering around my mattress towards the center of the room. It stopped and lifted up its head, much like a cobra would, and the pointed part of its head, if you could call it that, was pointed towards the guinea pig cage. Reese, I whispered loudly. Yeah, came a faint reply. Do you see that? Uh, yeah... She whispered again. What is... I began to speak in a normal voice, no longer whispering, but that was a huge mistake. Whatever this thing was, it slammed itself into my sister's mattress, lifting up one corner and pushing it and its occupants into the wall nearest them. And at that, the dog just took off and how she got past that thing, I'll never know, but we just started screaming our lungs out. I remember thinking, I don't know what my parents could do about this giant cobra thing that we had in our room, but at least if they saw it too, they would know finally that I'd been telling the truth. But then, as my sister and I were looking at this thing and then back and forth at each other, the creature just suddenly was gone. Like, it literally just disappeared right in front of us. To this day, we 
have no idea what happened to it, but we believe that it must have gone into our closet. Well, as kids, that's what we convinced ourselves at the time what happened. My parents came running into the room and turned our light on, saw my sister's mattress in disarray, one end towards the wall. We started telling them what happened. They looked over my sister and found a sort of red mark on her shoulder where she hit the wall. They looked for the dog and found her trembling under their bed. And then they let us sleep with them for the night. Strangely enough too, this thing, it never came back after that. But over the next few weeks, I would hear this sort of messing around in the trash can at night again. That eventually stopped and then I heard it clicking something on the hardwood floors for years after that. We never did see it again, but somehow I just knew that it wasn't gone. Obviously, I sort of reconstructed this story from talking to my sister and my parents because I've actually sort of repressed parts of it, I think, and she had repressed others, but everything that you've just heard, I swear by it that it's true. In fact, I spent the next 20 years trying to figure out what the heck that thing was, but Alas, Google, unfortunately, has failed me, and our story seems to be one that's pretty unique. So, I have no idea what happened, but I would like to ask for some help. Has anyone heard of anything like this before? Was it some sort of a, a cryptid, an interdimensional being, or a ghost, or were we just hallucinating? Was it sleep paralysis? If you've got any ideas as to what happened that night, then please do share it with us because we would like to try and figure this out. I decided to take my dogs for a walk today on one of the trails near my house. I told my husband that I was heading out and wouldn't be gone long. Bensatart Woods Environmental Education Center was where I ended up. I got there around 11.30 in the morning, and away we went. Absolutely beautiful day. Trails were totally empty, the perfect walk conditions pretty much. I had my two female Alaskan Malamutes with me. This is important later too. But we headed down the green trail since it was the shortest, and went by some marsh or bogs, and the girls loved to watch the ducks, so it was a nice time. The walk was pretty much uneventful for the first little bit, just the birds chirping trying to get some birdie loving, the wind in the trees, the usual forest sounds, and then I heard my name. Weird, but it could be someone with a radio on a different trail. Both my dogs were looking in the direction that I heard it coming from. An uneasy feeling starts setting in, but like every rational person, I just chalk it up to an overactive imagination and continue on. But then I hear my name again, a little louder and a little more insistent, if you will. Instead of looking towards where the sounds were coming from, though, I look at my dogs, who are both staring in the direction of my name, and I notice that my older female's hackles were slowly raising. So at that, I thought to myself, yeah, it's time to go. She's not happy. I decided to turn around and go back the way that we came. We only had gone maybe 10 minutes down the trail, I would guess, so it was faster just to turn back anyway. The sign at the trailhead said that it was a 45-minute loop. I hear my name again, though. We walk faster because now the hackles on both my dogs are up. One is two years old and her daughter is eight months old, and hackles up on a puppy is definitely a sign that she's scared. But then I notice that my dogs, they aren't pulling me. They're Alaskan Malamutes, they're bred to pull pretty much, and I mean, anytime we walk literally anywhere on a leash, they're pretty much guaranteed to pull, but now, these two dogs are directly beside me, one on the left and one on the right. Kivli now has a low constant growl like she's warning whatever she can't see to back right off, and on our way back, the exact route that we came there was a log in the middle of the trail. I could see my shoe prints in the mud and my dog's paw prints heading the other direction, under this log. Which means that this log was definitely not there on our way in. It was big enough and awkward enough that we had to go around it too. Not far off the trail, just a few steps. I say, come on Kiv, come on Echo, let's go. 
and they follow reluctantly. We hustle back onto the trail, but then I hear Echo's name. She looks, shortly after I hear Kiv. We're now in a light jog back to the car. The hairs on the back of my neck are now standing up, and everything in my body is screaming to run. Run faster, get out of here. I hear my name again suddenly, but this time it was angry. The closer that we got to the trailhead, the more desperate my name sounds. We're full on running at this point. We got to the parking lot, and I noticed that I can hear the wind and the birds again all of a sudden. I hadn't even realized that I must have stopped hearing the birds and the wind at some point. Well, we piled into the car as fast as we could and we just didn't look back. I don't know, am I crazy? Did I upset something? I didn't take anything, I didn't move anything, I didn't even touch anything. Anytime I take my dogs on trails, I'm careful to respect nature and make sure my dogs do too. We even bring our own sticks for them to carry if they want one so they don't take anything from the parks. I don't know. Was it just some creepy person trying to scare us or is there something else to it? This happened when I was 13. I'm a girl as well. And in the 8th grade and the middle school that I went to was about a 15 minute walk, so not very far. For context too, my older brother and I, we grew up in East LA, in a small house that had a metal gate and both in front and back doors had a black metal screen door and a wooden door too. During the day, we would always leave the wooden door open and have the black metal door closed and locked. Well, except this day. That day, I came home from school and had about an hour before anyone else would be home. I was really thirsty, so I rushed inside and grabbed a drink, sat down at the kitchen table, which was about 10 feet away from the front door. I then heard the metal gate open and was surprised as no one should have been coming home that early. I got up to see who it was and saw an older man, probably in his 60s. He had short white hair and a long white beard. He was wearing an ACDC t-shirt, torn jeans and sunglasses. I remember thinking too that he looked a lot like Santa Claus but dirty and creepy. Well, he knocked on the metal screen door and asked if my parents were home. I was a dumb kid though and said that they weren't. He had a huge smile on his face at that point and said that he collected donations for needy children. I said sorry but I didn't have any money. He said sometimes children donated old toys. I said I didn't have any old toys to donate. He insisted that I must have some toys that I didn't want anymore. He was beginning to creep me out a bit and it was then that I noticed that I hadn't locked the door when I came inside. I tried to keep my cool as I slowly and very carefully moved my hand, locked the door. I kept him talking so that he wouldn't notice and a minute or two later he just wouldn't leave so I decided that I would pretend to check for toys and then say that I didn't have any so he would hopefully leave. I told him that I would go and check and as I turned and took a few steps down the hall, I clearly heard him yank at that door trying to open it. I didn't want him to know that I had heard, so I just kept walking down the hall and into a room. I didn't have a cell phone, and the only phone in the house was in the kitchen. I thought about what I should do and decided to stick with my plan. After about two or three minutes, I walked out, hoping that he'd left, but nope. Creepy Santa man was still just standing there. I told him sorry, but I didn't find anything. He sighed and said, alright, he would check another time. He then left and walked across the street. I watched him from the kitchen window peeking through the blinds as he just stood there staring at my house for what must have been at least another 45 minutes. My brother and a few friends of his finally came walking down the street and as my brother came inside and his friends kept walking down the street, the man chose to walk around the corner and, and just disappeared. I told my brother what happened and he walked outside to look but by that time creepy Santa man was long gone. When my mum came home we told her what happened and she called the cops but they said to call back if he ever showed up again. Thankfully too he never did show up again but 
It was a, a creepy experience, to say the least. As a bit of a warning for you guys, this is going to be a very long one. I'll try to be as concise and organized as possible, but this is my third draft now trying to tell this story as neatly as possible. There has been so many different events and there's lots of details to comb through. But the reason that I'm sharing this is to, well, share my experience. But I guess also to possibly seek advice. This has reached a bit of a breaking point that has left me scared and ready to possibly seek help. Be it a spiritual medium, an exorcist, or maybe even a psychologist. Whatever the case, I believe that something is harassing myself, my girlfriend, my house, my family, and very importantly, my children. I don't think that this is a, a passive being and every time something new happens I believe more and more that this is possibly dangerous. But before I get ahead of myself, to give some backstory, I'm 26 and my girlfriend is 22. Her name is B, and B and I have been friends for many years but we've only been dating for a little over a year now. I have children from a previously failed marriage, they visit on the weekends. After the divorce, I moved in with my parents to sort of restart and get back on my feet. I no longer live there, obviously, but I found this information relevant as it is where most of the story takes place. I often travel for my job, and this is also relevant, but not until much later in the story. So, to be frank, B, she sees things. She also hears things, and she has described many horrifying visions and sounds, and I knew that she had experienced this, and while I have also had my own experiences, I've never experienced anything like what she describes. I have never judged her for what she describes, and I have always kept an open mind. I do believe in the paranormal, but I also believe in people needing psychiatric help from time to time too. I have always thought that B's experiences are one or the other as well, but as for which one... It's always been pretty irrelevant to me, to be honest. I mean, I'm here for her, and when the time comes that things reach a boiling point, I'm going to continue to be there for her too. It did not take long after we started dating for me to also share some of her experiences. They started off very simple, if that's the right word, and sort of easy to brush off. That not feeling right in certain parts of the house was pretty common. Feeling watched seeing a shadow in sort of the peripheral of my vision. These are the kinds of things that we naturally write off as tricks of the imagination, just stress or what have you, even though we had both seen it at the same time. She says that the things that she usually sees are not of great detail. If she was to observe them, she would never be able to make out the details, nor make sense of the words that she hears. There's no facial details, clothing, anything of that nature. Now, I don't know if this just means that they're pure black or if they're more of a blur or something. I'm not too sure, but she says that there are two exceptions though. Two things that she has seen repeatedly throughout her life and they are the only two things that she's ever been able to make details out of. She refers to them as the tub man and the nose guy. I believe it's best not to give them names, but this is what she calls them. The tub man she has seen in several houses, her childhood home, a friend's house, and others. She describes him as sort of being skinny and lanky and wearing red shoes. She has never seen his top half too well or his face because whenever she sees him, he's already halfway in the tub. That's it. She'll see him crawling from the floor into the tub as if he was a spider or something, and she always catches those red shoes of his too. I want to say that she said that he's in normal clothes, but I can't say that for certain. The shoes though are what stand out the most. The nose man on the other hand, she has only seen in her childhood home. And he's not so much a man as he is just a, well, a nose. I know, I know, it sounds silly, like some sort of a Cronenberg monster. A giant fleshy nose man that just looks at her and watches her, if he even has eyes. I'm not sure, but 
Now, I know that this may not seem that relevant, but trust me, I've tried to leave out any details that I find irrelevant. And now, I'm going to delve into our experiences together. So, when you enter my parents' house, there's this living room sort of immediately in front, the kitchen to your left through the passway with the pantry and the garage door and stairs to your right. So left, kitchen, front, living room, right, stairs. Stairs going up and stairs going down. Upstairs is my sister's room and my parents' room, and downstairs is another sort of small living space, I guess, a bathroom and also what became mine and B's room. I'm going to mostly skip over all of the smaller experiences of us not feeling right in that smaller living space downstairs. But to be brief, until we had moved in, it had went mostly unused and shortly after we had moved in, I had realized that I really didn't like one particular corner of this room, and neither did B. But there were a lot of times where we would find the lights on in closets downstairs when nobody was home or in the middle of the night too. Sometimes when we would pass by to go to the bathroom, we would feel like something was rushing at us. But the first real experience for both of us that I can remember anyway that really had us freaked out was well, while she was using the bathroom. So I was in the bedroom, which is directly next to the bathroom, lying in bed on my phone. It was about midday, I would guess, and she had come back into the bedroom and asked what I wanted. I wasn't sure what she meant by that, and had asked her to explain and she had said that I was knocking on the bathroom door and was also asking to come in. She had said that it was locked and that she had asked me to wait. I had assured her that it was definitely not me and that I would have heard someone knocking at the door. She seemed a, a little bit frazzled by that and had assured me that it was definitely my voice. I jumped to us both showering one day and we had wrapped up and gotten dressed in the bathroom. She went to leave and said something is holding the door shut. I was obviously in disbelief, so I came over and turned the handle firmly but slowly and opened the door. It barely had cracked open too before, and I swear on my life, the handle very firmly twisted the other way in my hand and then pulled shut. I immediately swung the door open and rushed out of the bathroom to confront whoever this was, but of course, there was nobody there. This is almost a year ago now, but if I'm trying to keep a sort of chronological order, I believe this is what happened next. I was off at work and she was still in bed. She had heard my computer chair creaking multiple times. She felt like somebody was in the room and had pulled the blanket up over her head a bit and taken a peek. And she later described to me that a pale and gaunt woman was sitting in my chair, just smiling, smiling and staring at her. I don't remember if she said that there was something unnatural about her smile, but I believe that it seemed like a, a large smile from memory. But she also had eyes, not blank, not black. I don't recall what color her eyes were as I'm colorblind and that detail didn't stick out with me, but my ears work and my eyes don't. Regardless though, I don't remember, though if I recall correctly, her hair was not black and it was a lighter color such as blonde or soft brown or something, long and sort of wispy. I wish that I had asked more about this woman to be honest, such as what was she wearing or any descriptive features, but B... She seemed very stressed out by this particular incident, so I didn't push for any more details. The reason this stressed her out so bad, though, was because she could actually see this woman. It wasn't like the other times. She was more like Nose Guy and Tub Man. She could see every detail of her. But at this, she just turned back over, pretended to sleep, and waited for me to get home. But when I got into the room, I didn't see her. Before COVID had gotten too bad and us being ignorant of how bad it was going to be, we had taken a trip to Michigan at some point. It was the whole family too, except for my sister. She had stayed behind and watched the house for us and fed the animals and stuff. We must have been gone for a week and B and I had gotten home the following weekend before my parents. It was already late at night and we were unpacking the car and she had ran inside 
I kept unpacking, but was suddenly overwhelmed with this really sickening feeling of being watched. It was worse than any other time before, and for some reason I sort of kept looking to the side to the house that led around to the back of the house. I eventually grabbed some luggage though and then just sort of rushed inside. I had gotten inside and closed the front door. Immediately my attention was drawn to the window in the back. I couldn't see anything there, but it just felt like something was looking right back at me, but just out of sight in the darkness and... Then I noticed, to my right, one of our cats was also sitting and just staring at the window. I tried snapping my fingers and saying her name. She didn't even flick her little ears though, she just kept staring. B had come back upstairs and we went outside to grab some more luggage. I had mentioned to her that I felt like I was being watched. I hadn't mentioned the window, but... Then she immediately jumped in and said that she felt like someone was watching her from the back window. Oh, but we hurriedly got everything inside and talked to my sister. We asked her how the week was and she said everything was fine. But we noticed that she was in her room and while that makes perfect sense for any teenage girl to be sitting in her room, it just wasn't like her. You see... She always sits in the living room surrounded by all the animals and watches YouTube videos on the TV. So we asked her if anything seemed strange while we were gone, but we were very vague about any details. And she too had filled in the blanks, even pointing out that, even pointing to the same window. She said that she hadn't left her room any more than she possibly had to in the first few days because suddenly she felt like she was being watched from that window. He eventually grabbed flashlights and investigated the backyard, obviously to no avail, so we moved on. The next event seems strange to note, but just like everything else, bear with me, there's a reason that I'm taking a note of it. So, while I was staying with my parents, I unfortunately didn't have a bed for both of the children. but They both slept on the same bed. Really, it was sort of a pull-out mattress from the sofa in the downstairs living space. And yeah, it's not an amazing setup by any means, but I was trying to do what I could to just see my girls. I would set them up at night in that bed and give them each one of their favorite stuffed animals, and I'd let them watch TV with almost no volume just to help them fall asleep and stuff. I'm aware that I really shouldn't let them have the TV on when they're sleeping, but I sympathize with the idea of being scared in the dark. As an adult, I still sleep with the TV on in fact, or rather at least some noise like a fan or music or some kind of light. I really don't like dark on top of pure silence. Anyway, maybe I'm a scaredy cat, but the point is is that I let the girls keep the TV on. Okay, so my youngest daughter is known to get up and seek out an adult. For no real reason other than probably comfort, I would guess. She doesn't come crying or scared or anything of that nature. She just kind of gets up finds an adult and is like, hey, can I hang out here too? I know, it's a bit weird, but not in so many words or anything. To which you usually just have to tell her that it's bedtime and to go lay down, sweetie. She'll go right back to bed, no problems. It's just something she's always done. So one night we had noticed that more than usual, she just didn't seem to want to stay in her bed. Usually she'll just knock on the door and I'll send her back to bed. And this happened a couple of times, but the only time that she would go upstairs was if she heard someone else such as my dad. So, uh, on this night, with her continuing to get out of bed, we wanted to know if there was a particular reason. So we had our lights off and we had cracked the door. We were keeping an eye on her and after a short period, we saw her get up again like normal. We didn't hear anything or see anything that would have made her get up and check if someone was there. But she walked over to the bottom of the stairs and just stared up the stairs. And she stared for a really uncomfortable amount of time too. We watched her, unsure what to do next. Obviously we knew that we needed to put her back down, but I think that we were just curious if she was going to, you know, turn around and knock on the door again or go lie back down herself. Now, there is, and I need to stress this, almost no lights upstairs. I mean, you can't really see anything. Everyone is asleep at this point. There's not a single sound. 
The only glow of light is not from the middle floor, but the upstairs hallway. But she starts climbing the stairs. It's a short set of stairs, mind you, but she's climbing it. She reaches the top, and B and I slowly open the door and come out. As quietly as we possibly could, we climb the stairs after her. She had went through the small passageway in between the pantry and the garage into the kitchen, and she's just standing there in the dark but we can barely see her but she's definitely standing in the middle of the kitchen and staring into the blackness towards the corner of the kitchen by the window above the sink take note too that this is that same window above the sink after an uncomfortable amount of time we say her name and she bolts a bit turns around says hi and comes up and gives me a hug well we asked her if something's wrong and what she was doing. She quite literally shrugs her little shoulders, points to the kitchen window area, and then puts her head on me. So we take her downstairs, put her to bed, and we don't really sleep right away until that uneasy feeling passes. Again, trying to keep things chronological here, the next incident I can think of happened in the middle of the day while my girls were visiting. My girls are very young, but I'm not going to disclose their ages. I will say, though, that one of them is young enough to not quite make coherent sentences, but she does love to talk. The older of the two is no longer a toddler. She's a kid, and before I know it, she's going to be a teenager. But my dad, B, and I were outside putting together a swing set for my kids at some point. Which, if you've ever put one together, then you know that it's not as fun as using the swing set, that's for sure. It's actually quite a hassle, and it was taking a lot more time than we had thought that it was going to. Admittedly, I don't recall where my mother or my sister were, but I do recall that they were not there. So we had set the children up at the kitchen table with some kinetic sand and Legos, figured that that could be some good messy fun for us to clean up after building this swing set. But we would work on the swing set and go in to check on the children from time to time. I should note too that... The children, they can actually see us from the window and we could see them. The window was even open at this point. But B suddenly described feeling sick to me, like something just wasn't right. So I asked her to check on the children and kept on the swing set. She went in and was immediately struck with an even worse feeling. She asked my oldest daughter where her sister was and she said that she went upstairs with Mormor, my mother. But... My mum, she isn't home at this point. And even writing this out just makes me feel nauseous. Probably because my children are involved, right? But B ran upstairs and she described feeling a, a weird sensation. As she describes it, when she was talking to my daughter, she couldn't hear anything else. But as she reached the top of the stairs, she could very clearly hear my younger daughter screaming and crying that she wanted out. She tried the door and it was locked. She ran downstairs to get a butter knife and rushed back up, unlocked it, went inside, and she had to unlock my parents' bathroom door as well. She got her out and held her. She said that she had dried tears on her face, but she couldn't have been gone that long, surely. Well, we were constantly keeping an eye on them through the window, even as we worked on this swing set after that. And B said that she could hear her yelling the whole time all of a sudden after she reached the top of the stairs. All the way back into the kitchen, she could hear her. But the strange thing is, is why could she hear her before? And why hadn't my older daughter heard her the whole time too? Not to mention that she knows how to lock and unlock doors, so how did she end up in that situation in the first place? Did she start to panic and couldn't get the door unlocked? I still think about my daughter saying that she went upstairs with Mom. That one really freaks me out. I just feel like something is luring my daughter and the idea of that woman that B saw, man, it just makes me feel sick. Uh, also, I just thought of a detail that kind of is important for later too. My parents have the master bedroom of course. They have their own bedroom attached, and then from the bathroom is how you enter their closet. It's a sort of walk-in closet, and it's a very strange setup since it's somewhat of a series of doors, and 
it's kind of a bit bogus, but hey, it's not my house and it's theirs. But some time passes and my brother and his wife visit. Everything goes on normal and it's a good time. We play some Animal Crossing and we all hang out. They're getting ready to leave and somehow spooky stories are brought up and they were brought up by my brother's wife, I think. Just fun stories. But we start telling them about some of the things that we've experienced in this house and they exchange glances in an almost cartoon fashion. My brother's wife then asked us to go outside. I was puzzled, but we went outside. She then elaborated that she was afraid that somebody was in our house and that she didn't want them to hear us, like a squatter in our attic or something. They began sharing stories of how bothered they had been in the past at this house too. These were all before we had moved in, of course, some of which I don't recall at all, and at the time I couldn't relate to them. Some others, though, were definitely similar to our experiences in that same closet, and the same rooms would have their lights on with the doors closed and stuff, and some doors would open or close when they weren't looking, and three of the stories stood out to be, and so I'll briefly share those now, too. So the first one was my brother was playing the new Star Wars game on his PS4 downstairs. His wife was upstairs. He had seen someone in the corner of his eye walk down the stairs and go to the bathroom and close the door. They had turned the light on as well, but after they had closed the door, he had assumed that it was his wife. But his wife was still upstairs, and when he had realized that, he went to open the bathroom door and nobody was in it. This is bothersome too because it's the same bathroom where B had heard my voice when I wasn't there and where something had turned the handle and closed the door when B and I were trying to open the door that time. The second one was when they were feeding the animals while the rest of the family was out of town. Again we didn't live there yet but my parents and my sister were out of town and they were feeding both dogs and both cats all weekend long too. When randomly, in the middle of the week, they could no longer find one of the cats. They had searched all over the house too, and finally they had gone upstairs and checked my parents' room. They had run out of options, but they hadn't checked it previously because they had no reason over the whole weekend to go into my parents' room. The cat was not in my parents' room, nor was it in the bathroom, but it was in that creepy closet. Now... You remember that setup that I mentioned earlier? I mean, how does a cat go through three doors and get stuck in the closet when nobody's home? This situation bothered me because, well, frankly, it reminded me of what happened with my younger daughter and it really upset me. It's probably also a good time to note that we constantly find the cats in the closets. Sometimes we don't even let them out. For example, when everyone is in the house and sleeping, but... Her and I, we play games all night. We would go to the middle level to get her food and we would hear sort of a door click open, look upstairs and see the male cat walk out of the towel closet very nonchalantly. This has happened three different times too, but nobody let them out. The door just opens by itself and he walks out. The third story from my brother and his wife, and this one is kind of simple, but... They were house-sitting again, as they often did for my parents. My brother was staying up playing some games on his laptop, and he had went outside to have a smoke. He was sitting on the bench outside, and this bench is right outside of the kitchen. Towards the back of the house, too, he had been there for some time, and the light from the kitchen window was shining across the ground. He said that a woman had walked into the window, and she was standing there in that window, and he said that it scared him because... He knew that it wasn't my wife. Like the silhouette didn't look like hers and he knew that she was asleep. And when he finally mustered up the courage to stand up and take a look in the window, there was nobody there. The shadow was gone and when he had went back inside, he had confirmed that his wife had been sleeping the whole time. The reason this story bothers me as well is because that window... It's the window where my daughter was staring in the middle of the dark of the kitchen that night. One experience my sister was a part of was when I was on my way to work. I got a text from B. She was still in bed, but all it said was, something is in the room. And a follow-up message about things getting knocked over and 
She's too scared to get out of bed. It's like 5.30 in the morning and still dark. I knew my sister would get up that early because, well, she's unhealthy, much like us, so I called her and asked her to go check on me. She went downstairs and turned the light on, and when she did, she saw that my fan was knocked over and that all the stuff on my dresser was knocked over as well. This is all on the opposite side of the room where B is in the bed, but they eventually fixed everything and kept the lights on until the sun came up. There are only two more stories before we get caught up with the present moment. Both of these stories are the most recent and they've both happened in the past 30 days. But they both really concerned me because they both tie all of the events together but also make them all much harder to understand. As I said before, I travel for work, especially right now as the area of Indiana that I'm in is considered a red zone for COVID. So all the local work was pretty much shut down. But about a month ago, we were on our way to a job in Georgia. And there's not really that much set up for what happened because, well, it just happened very suddenly. We'd been driving for many hours already, but we weren't overly tired or anything. We always stop for naps in the car or something like that if we think that we're getting too tired on a long road trip. We'd been driving on the highway for most of the trip, but... As we were getting close to the destination, the GPS had taken us off onto some sort of local roads for the rest of the trip, which we found odd because I didn't think Albany was that off the beaten path. But we had gotten onto a decent stretch of road though in the backwoods of Georgia on our way to Albany, but we still had a ways to go. Well, we both had started to feel a, a little off about the road that we were on. Nothing too specific, but just that feeling that creeps up on you, you know? Realizing that I could always turn on my bright since I'm no longer on the highway, and maybe it would help us feel a little better to be able to see more of what's around us, I decided that that's what I would do. But no sooner than I had turned on my lights, I could see something on the side of the road. It was coming out of the woods and towards the road. I couldn't make out what it was, and then we were passing it. As we had gotten closer though, and I was able to distinguish it more, I can only describe it as... A grey, even for my eyes being somewhat colorblind, human sized, sort of fleshy, shaking thing. Not shaking like a bag blowing in the wind or fabric caught on trees. Besides, I had clearly watched it come from inside the woods, and it was shaking like it was having a convulsion. You ever seen the Silent Hill movie? Remember that thing on the road that attacks the cop lady? Like a person gift wrapped in their own skin? It was like that, but less person and more shaky. The same color though. I instantly asked her if she had seen what I just saw and she was thoroughly freaked out and described exactly what I had just seen. She said that it looked like the same fleshy material that the nose guy always was. Now this part is strange to me though because it's a bit of a departure I guess from everything else that we've experienced. It seems entirely unrelated to everything else Besides her relation to the nose guy, I suppose, but it's important to me because it's the first unexplainable thing that I've ever seen for myself. Every story until this point has happened around me. I felt things for sure. Everyone's stories kept matching up and I did feel something close the door that time, but this was the first thing that I'd actually seen with my own eyes. But me being the stupid person that I am, I needed closure, so... I actually turned the car around to go and check out what it was. When we did, there was nothing there. No semi-truck tarp caught on a tree. No amalgamation of small garbage bags creating a sort of larger, scarier garbage bag. And no spooky Silent Hill monster either. I was a bit shaken though, but... On to the last one and the most recent story. So, I'm currently in Pasco, Washington another job and it was all together with naps and food stops over a two-day drive we made the usual rest stops off the toll road at those designated rest areas everything was totally normal but in one of the rest areas we had split and went into our own respective restrooms myself to the men's and her to the ladies room i had gotten out before and was checking out the snack machines which wisconsin why do you have cheese curds and pickles in your snack machines? 
Anyway, when she came out, I had taken note that she came out of the ladies' room on the opposite side of the rest area. I didn't think too much of it, but I did notice it. But she seemed sort of off, and we kept moving on. Thinking back, I should have asked her if she was alright. Rest areas can be shady after all. So we drove another day, and we were about six hours away from our destination. I remember looking at the woods next to us and remembering the thing that we had seen in Georgia. And I just got thinking about everything, and I asked her if it was relieving that I had seen it as well. My logic here is that she always questioned herself and the things that she sees, since she's the only one that had seen them, and I think that's kind of natural, right? She said that it was relieving in some sense that I had seen it, but it also terrified her because, well, it makes her wonder if everything else is in her head or if they're all real. She said that if they are all real, then she doesn't want to be alive anymore which I know, it's super heavy, right? But I really don't blame her. I mean, if she's seen things like what I had her whole life, then I don't know if I'd want to continue either. Anyway, I got thinking about everything again and asked her out of nowhere if she thought that the woman that she saw was what lured my daughter upstairs. And she just started panicking. I mean, scared for her life, she started crying and telling me, no, 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 don't talk about her. She was so afraid, she started looking in the back of the car to make sure she wasn't in the car. This idea and her panic really terrified me too, of course. And she told me through her tears that the previous day at that rest area, when she had went into the first woman's room, that when she went around the corner and looked in, that she was in there. And apparently, she slowly lifted her head above the wall of the stall and looked right at her. I assume with that same smile that she told me about before, but I can't say for certain. I mean, I didn't want to ask her. I just tried to calm her down at this point. She didn't want to talk about her or bring her up. She thought that even the fact that I had thought about her and mentioned her wasn't a coincidence. I reassured her, though, that it was, but it made me question it as well. I mean, we hadn't spoken about it in so long that... It was very coincidental. But the reason though that it terrified her so much was because this is the second time that she'd seen her. Only Tubman and Nose Guy have ever been repeating. But now she is too. The idea that something like that could follow us out of state, man, it really scared me more than anything as well. And unfortunately, that's all I've really got at this point. I've spent pretty much all day just typing this out and trying to make it coherent for you guys too. I don't know if anyone is really going to get through all of this, but I'm just kind of desperate to be honest. I need to know if anyone has had similar experiences, if anyone knows anything about this, if we need a, a medium or if we need a, a psychiatric help, I, I don't know what to do. There are so many little details and bits and pieces that... I've probably missed, maybe even important ones, but I've done the best that I could to try and explain everything I found important. I hope I haven't forgotten anything too big, but if you've gotten this far, then thanks for listening. Also, a bit unrelated, but if anyone is concerned about how much we travel during these times, let me reassure you that we very much keep to ourselves. We distance from everyone at stops, keep to ourselves at home, and my work is on oil tanks. The only people that I run into are on my crew. I can't provide evidence of any of the things that we've seen. Only pictures of like animals, the house, points on the map I guess. Pictures of the places that we've been I suppose. Basically I can back up every detail of my life. Except for the paranormal part obviously. But I guess if it really was that easy then everyone would believe though. Wouldn't they? Anyway, thanks for your time and please do help me if you can. So a few years ago, I, a female and 17 at the time, would attend community college at the outskirts of my hometown. 
I would take an hour and a half long bus drive because both my parents worked and my other siblings were too young to drive me so it's what I had to do. The outskirts of my town, despite being the literal outskirts, are more populated than you'd expect. With strip malls and apartment buildings, pretty much everything you need is there. The bus would drop me off about maybe four blocks from my university, which isn't too far. And I always enjoyed those few minutes. It gave me time to sort of disassociate. Anyway, this one time I left my phone at the library like a true idiot. Using my brother's phone, I called a friend who worked at the school library during the late evening shift, 7 to 9, and he said that he'd bring my phone to me, but he lived closer to the college than I did, so I told him that I would just meet him at his shift and I would pick it up myself. He said okay to this, and I boarded the bus at around 6. Now, I get off the bus at my usual spot, and the place looked, well, deserted. I'd never been there that late at night before and maybe it was because it was a, a weekday that people were home or uh, I don't know but I had my brother's phone in my pocket and I just clutched it tighter and tighter and picked up my speed until I was practically jogging. I'm nearing to a corner when a flash of light goes off to my right. There in the shadows is a really slimy, grimy looking man. He's balding with a tourist shirt unbuttoned halfway, showing off his chest hair. And he was wearing sunglasses at night, but was wearing some sort of gold jewelry and was probably borderline morbidly obese. Just picture the word sleazy as a person and you probably have it. Most importantly, he had just taken a picture of me. The instant that I saw the flash go off, I knew it was coming from his phone too. Now, I think it's important to understand our positioning for this. So, he was pressed against a building to my right, right at the corner I had to turn. I was about 10 feet away from him, and to my left, on the same side of the street, was a car with blacked out windows, no license plates, directly across the sidewalk from this man. The car was parked with the driver's seat facing me, so that meant that it was on the wrong side of the road, because Americans drive on the right side, as opposed to the left. Now, I had slowed down at that point as I began to debate my next move. Cross the street and continue walking, make a break for the school, turn 180 and leave my phone at the library, or approach the potentially dangerous man. In the end, I probably did the stupidest thing possible and approached the man. I'm not going to sit here and give you like street advice or anything, but maybe just don't do what I did. I'm alive, but I was definitely lucky. Anyway, I demanded to know what he was doing, and he looked sort of taken aback by that question. I could see his brain sort of short-circuiting because this tiny young girl was red in the face, demanding to know what he was doing. He eventually sputtered out about how he was just standing here. I said... No, I saw you take that picture of me, man. And his face immediately fell. He started saying, no he didn't, he hadn't done that. Why would he want a picture of me? I had imagined it. At this, I asked to see his gallery, which I know is extremely risky because who knows what I would have seen and getting close to the guy like that was crazy, but it's what I did. He slowly pulls up his gallery and as it's opening... I see a blurry picture of me in the distance. To be honest, I didn't think that I would get that far. Granted, I had been running on adrenaline during our whole interaction, but this really made me pause. I told him to instantly delete it, but then a door slammed shut. and I just knew that it was that parked car across the road. My brain cleared up very quickly, and I hightailed it quickly to the school. But as I was running, I could hear a single pair of footsteps behind me. I sure as heck wasn't about to turn around though and check out who it was. But the car started at some point. They would have had to have done a U-turn on a relatively narrow street just to be able to follow me. And to be honest, I think that's what saved my life that night. The fact that the car was parked facing the wrong direction. Eventually I reached the school out of breath and in tears. My friend opened the building for me and I was crying explaining what happened. He locked us in while we waited for the police but 
Unfortunately, the sleazy guy and his buddy, they were never found. Anyway, my mum had gotten out of work by that point and I called her to ask to pick me up. We waited with my friend until the end of his shift and drove him home too. Needless to say, these days I carry mace with me everywhere I go now and am yet to find a police report stating a guy matching his description had been arrested. To be honest, I don't think the police actually believed me fully, but who knows. Oh, and uh, to this day too, I wonder what would have happened if I hadn't have confronted him. Would I be here to write this story out, or did I put myself in unnecessary danger by doing that? I don't know. All I can say is that I'm thankful that I'm here. So I used to order pizza a lot. I mean, I love pizza. Who doesn't, right? Well, my local pizza place, it got a new driver who just oh, way, way overstepped the boundaries of what's acceptable. I mean, he tried to force his way into my home at one point to share dinner with me, and just really general creepy behavior. So I stopped ordering pizza altogether. Well, really, I personally never noticed anything. I have a security system, so I figured all was well, and I never check it, really. But about two months after the pizza incident, I hear scratching at the side of my home. I figure that it must be an animal. I do live outside the city, so there are animals here looking for a place to nest. There was also a big fresh coating of snow, and it was cold, so I can only imagine that something is looking for a way in to be warm. So I do what I usually do. I let my dog out. He's huge, like 120 pounds, King Shepherd and Marima, and he just bolts out the door. Again, not totally unlike him when there's an animal outside. But about 15 to 20 seconds later, I hear screaming and swearing, then screaming in pain and terror. I scream for my dog to come back, and he does. He's a good boy, and I call the police. Well, they do a search of the outside of the house, and what they find is blood, like lots of blood, and pry marks at the side of my house. We go through the footage of my security system, and sure enough, there's a person who's trying to force the window open. My dog charges him and tears at his butt and gets his leg pretty bad too, until I call him back and he gets up and limps off of my property. Well, at the front of my property, the entrance to my drive, I also have a camera. It's pretty well hidden. And I get the guy going to his car and also his plates. And the cops take it and they go to the hospital. Apparently, there was a lot of blood. And whoever this person was, they were definitely going to need medical attention. Well, the police eventually find this guy. And apparently he says to them, Oh, I was just trying to surprise my girlfriend and I fell. But... I'm a widow and, honestly, I never plan on dating again for the rest of my life. But they came back to my house, tell me this and show me a picture. And sure enough, it was the pizza guy. The most disturbing thing is that they eventually searched his car and they found rope, duct tape, a camera and a knife in his car. I hear a lot of stories on here about stalkers and whatnot, and a lot of people blow it off as not a big deal, but really, you should take it seriously because you never know who might be watching. When I was around 11 years old, my family and I had just moved from Tennessee to Texas as my dad was working out a deal for a new job. My brother and I, we were homeschooled at this time, which meant that we could move in with my aunt and uncle with no problems, relating to finding a house in a good school district. My family was pretty close back then too, and all of the cousins got along just fine. But We loved to do everything together, especially me and my female cousin Peyton. My immediate family, meaning me, my mum, my dad, brother and sister, had spent the past seven years without a jack-in-the-box, yeah, it was terrible too. We were all born in Texas, so we loved it, but living in Tennessee, we had to go without it. 
Now, a particular night, however, all of our parents had gone out to dinner and told us very specifically to not leave the house. Well, we were to lock the doors after they left and play games or something. You might be thinking that this is now becoming about an intruder, but I promise that this is ten times more bizarre and I still have no idea what happened. So after the parents left, all of the cousins got together and we decided that we wanted ice cream and candy. Not that this is that important, but I remember Ben and Jerry's being the main target. So we devised a foolproof plan to sneak out and acquire the goods. Well, we thought it was foolproof. My older sister, the driver, my cousin Peyton and I, we all loaded into my dad's car that was left at the house and off we were to get some food. We shouldn't have even left, to be honest, but uh, kids do stupid things, right? So on our way to the store, we get the snacks. We decided that Jack in the Box sounded much better than some sugar, so off we went. And as we pulled up to the drive through we decided that it was about three cars too long and that we should just go inside and order instead. And that was a big mistake. When we stepped inside, there was one girl in this restaurant. She was short with a small figure and wearing winter clothes, so she looked completely ready for an outing. The girl asked the cashier for a water cup and the girl asked the cashier for a water cup and proceeded to fill it with either Sprite or some other soda. I remember the guy at the register sort of looking at her extremely confused, but it was a late night and he couldn't care less, I'm sure. When she finished filling up her cup, she drank it extremely quickly and started to turn around to throw the cup out and leave. Now, I have an awful memory, but I will never forget her eyes being wide open as if she had seen something scary. At this point, we had been standing at the entrance doors for the entire interaction, just sort of watching, for whatever reason. We were just nosy kids, I suppose, but as she was walking out, I looked down and noticed that she was gripping a, a large butcher's knife. And you guys, this thing was huge. Immediately, my heart dropped and I heard my cousin begin to freak out. So, this knife-wielding girl leaves the restaurant and... But we go on to order our food, talking about it to the guy at the register and kind of laughing it off, but also still very curious, confused, and a little bit scared, I admit. As we leave with our food, we see the girl crossing the street to the CVS. Now, it was kind of late, but there was still a good number of cars driving on this road at the time. She didn't look either way, just crossed with ease as if invincible but we brushed it off and assumed that she was just doing her own thing. After a while of eating some tacos and talking about how fun it was to be out without permission, we saw maybe a dozen police lights start to enter the CVS parking lot. Like I said before, we were pretty nosy kids, so we decided to do what any nosy person would do and investigate. We drove over to the CVS and we were stopped in the parking lot by an officer to be asked a couple of questions. My memory gets a bit hazy here, but I do remember that it was a problem because my cousin and I were both minors at the time, technically, or something about being minors, and involving ourselves with the police was actually a problem. So they asked us a couple of questions, and I just remember my sister and cousin explaining that we had seen a girl wielding a knife in the jack-in-the-box across the street. But with that, they eventually let us go, and we hurried back home. A little bit later that night, when everyone, parents included, were winding down for bed, our mothers called the three of us into one of the rooms in the house to talk about something. I don't think any of us really realized that they knew about what we did. They sat us down and calmly asked us what we did tonight, and I think we lied, but I don't quite remember. Either way, it was useless because somehow they knew everything, and even what we didn't know. You see, our mums told us that someone on Facebook had posted about three heroic girls that knew information about the girl in the situation that I'm about to explain to you. Heroic? Hardly. All we did was answer a few questions. A nosy? That's probably more like it. But they told us that this girl had entered the CVS and grabbed a woman by the hair and proceeded to hold the knife to her throat for like several minutes before the police could show up. Apparently, people had tried to get her off, but 
It was useless. After all, she did have that weapon. The girl was apparently screaming and just being very aggressive, but as that was many years ago, I don't really remember too many details. All I do remember is that it was a really scary situation for a lot of people. And to this day, I... I often think about how easily that could have been one of us with a knife to the throat in Fort Worth Jack in the Box, or how easily someone could have been hurt, or maybe even worse. Anyway, I'm just glad that everyone got out of that situation unscathed, and I'm really glad that nothing happened to us that night. I live in good old northeastern Maryland, closer to Delaware, and during the time of this story, I lived in a fairly new development. My family was the first family that lived in the house. In fact, we owned the house before it was even built, and it's still surrounded by forest and farmland too. I also explored the area by myself a bit, sometimes traveling miles to different areas of woods, sometimes closer to home. And although the forests weren't too thick, they were thick enough where you could be fully encased in them without seeing the edges for a while. I've got lots of fun stories about that place too, but I'll get to this one. So, this happened a few years ago, and I have since made peace with the event as perhaps being some sort of a time anomaly where it was somehow proof that the past, the present, and the future are all stacked on top of each other. I forget the terminology, but... Uh, that's not really important to the story. In any case, I was home with my only mother in the house with me. We had several strange paranormal experiences between the two of us in and outside of the house and around the development too, but nothing like this. We were both upstairs and the layout of the upstairs floor plan had my parents' room on one side of the house and mine was on the opposite side. But between us was a a large foyer type thing that had the steps to downstairs with a tall ceiling connecting the first and the second floor and a large bay window as well. It was midday on a weekend. I was high school age and playing on my phone in my bedroom while my mum was in her adjoining bathroom taking a shower in her room. It was quiet, quiet enough that I remember noting actually how eerie it was. And out of the dead silence I heard my voice clearly calling, Mum in a sort of irritated tone coming directly from the bottom of the steps in the foyer. I remember thinking that I must be hearing things. But then my mum responded, What? In that, I'm in the shower, why can't you kids leave me alone for two seconds of peace sort of tone. But at that, I shot up immediately and sped walked out of my room, hesitating to cross past the foyer, afraid of what I will see standing at the base of the steps. But I said screw it and ran across glancing down the stairs, but when I did, there was nothing. Well, I ran into the bathroom with my mum and all I could say was, Hey mum, th th that wasn't me. What? She replied, that wasn't me. She believed me, having experienced several strange things in the house as well most notable the woman that would walk into my sister's room every once in a while. She usually would show up only in your peripheral, but once I actually saw her head on, but that's another story. Anyway, we still talk about it today and theorize what it could have been. I feel the land is haunted or something in general in that area because there's a lot of creepy places and things that have happened there. I still have so many questions though, I mean... Could this have been a mimic? Some sort of a cryptid? But is it even possible that they mimic the voice of a person within the area? It's been a good four or five years since this happened and I still can't put my finger on it. But what do you guys think? Any thoughts would be much appreciated. <laughs> 